working on the patient from the seat because otherwise they'd be able to care about it. For example, I don't need to do You can't close the border with this. Oh, it was only... Sorry. We're just wondering, uh, we were waiting on the internet, right? Yeah, okay. Is somebody going to signal us? Someone going to come along with someone. Sorry, folks. Uh, we're just waiting on the internet. Neither Robin and I know any good jokes or we try to warm you up a little bit. Um, but just a reminder, there is a silent auction going on. It's live right now. You can go ahead and bend on items that's going on today and tomorrow. So make sure you check that out on the far wall. I see the uh, candidates are getting antsy. They're ready to throw fists. Hopefully we get that internet up soon so we don't have any violations of the NAP. All right, looks like we're good to go. So let me uh, call up the candidates. Nicholas Sarwark, come on up. Joshua Smith. Christopher Thrasher. And Matt Keenel. Now, we, we were going to, uh, it is Canada Day today, by the way. I was going to have you stand and, and sing the Canadian National Anthem, but uh, we're running behind, so we'll skip that uh, little Commonwealth red coat humor there for you, I guess. But So, the candidates have tokens, and there is uh, an order. Nicholas Sarwark, you got the most tokens. Which position would you like? You get to choose first, second, third, or last? Last. He's choosing last. Okay, Joshua Smith, you had the next most tokens. What position would you like? Second to last. Second last. And Christopher Thrasher, what? Well, let's not buck the trend. Let's just go ahead third to last. How about Third that? last? All right. Okay, so we have our order. So it'll be Matt, Christopher, Joshua, and Nicholas in that order. And uh, Robin, you want to read them the rules? Okay. Here are the rules. Listen carefully. Each of our candidates will give us a three-minute opening statement. Each of the candidates also holds four rebuttal cards that they can fling towards this wonderful room of libertarians at any point. If they do so, 
they get 30 seconds to speak when whoever is speaking has finished. They can play a rebuttal card on themselves, if they so wish, to extend their own uh, period by 30 seconds. We're going to begin the questions with a round of questions from you, the audience. We've collated them, gone through them. We've picked uh, the ones that we think are the best. And in some cases, we've collated a few similar questions uh, into you know, one question. After the candidates answer your questions, they answer three of ours. It's going to be six of yours, three of ours. Then, each of the candidates gets to ask two questions of other candidates. And we close with a two-minute closing statement that will be in the same order as the opening statement, the order that the candidates have just selected. Is that clear, gentlemen? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Is that clear, my libertarian friends? Yeah. Wonderful. Let's get ready to rumble. Okay. Take it away, Robin. Okay, so I have the distinct honor of asking the first question asked by you of our wannabe new chairman. Oh, hold on. Opening statements, sir. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Point Thank you. You already lost, lost, Robin. You, you can't get the stuff. The problem is these immigrants. They come in and we take... What <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> Matt Keenel, over to you for your opening statement. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Matt Keenel. Uh, if you... If you would have asked me uh, two years ago if I'd be up on this stage, I, I never would have guessed it. And uh, I can't thank everybody who gave me tokens enough uh, to give me this opportunity to get up, up here and speak. Uh, I'm definitely not the greatest speaker, and I probably don't have a great shot at winning, and that's not really why I'm up here. Uh, what I'm up here to speak to is to uh, a movement that we've started, uh, a movement that I'm a big part of uh, and has a lot of support with it, and we call that Bottom Unity. And when I joined this party, I joined for Gary Johnson. Uh, I was 100% I was in. I became a volunteer for his campaign. I came in expecting that there was already going to be this infrastructure, uh, that I was going to find all these people already involved and dedicated and, and doing professional things. And that's not what I found. I didn't find anybody in my area doing anything. Uh, we, we had to build up a, our own affiliate. Uh, we've built up that affiliate, it's the Libertarians of Macomb County. Uh, that, that affiliate, a lot of them are here today. That affiliate, in my opinion, is the most diverse ideological affiliate in the nation. Uh, we have everything from myself being an anarcho-communist. Uh, we have classical liberals. <laughs> we, have, we have the chair of the ANCAP caucus as our vice chair. Uh, we, have, we are so diverse in thought, yet every single meeting we have, Almost every single motion we put together, it's passed unanimously. And the way we do that is we focus on electoral politics, what this party is supposed to be doing. Uh, we focus on giving our candidates and getting candidates on the ballot and giving them the most opportunity that they can get. Uh, putting together different events to, to engage our community, to get their names out there, uh, to, to get our ideas across. And we don't really fight or bicker at all. Um, and that's what Bottom Unity is all about. It's about finding our common goals. And, and that really, that common goal in the Libertarian Party is taking down the state interference from our lives. So what I hope to see here in NOLA is for us to, to finally set aside these differences and, and decide that, you know, as long as we're working towards the same things, as long as we're helping each other and, and getting our candidates the, uh, the attention they deserve and our ideas the attention they deserve, that everybody has a spot in this party. And it doesn't matter if you're an, uh, economically left, economically right, as long as you agree that those should occur voluntarily and that those shouldn't be enforced, those shouldn't be put to, to force by the state, uh, 
we should be working on those common goals, and we have so many. All right, Christopher Thrasher, you have three minutes. Good evening, everyone. Once again, my name is Christopher Thrasher, and I have Your been a not member. Working. Oh, mic's not working. Get close. Let's see. How about this? Oh, ah, all right then. Well, hello. Once again, my name is Christopher Thrasher, and I have been a libertarian since 2008. Interestingly enough, I came from a very different place than probably most of the people in this room. I actually came from the left. I have served as the national campaign coordinator for a senator from Alaska by the name of Mike Gravel, who decided to change from a Democrat to a libertarian. And I said, okay, great. What exactly is a libertarian? Okay, sure, I'm in. Well, little did I know that I had found my political home until I got to the convention in Denver. I left that convention with a stack of books about yay high and uh, been here ever since. I must tell you, I am very impressed. Uh, first of all, I did want to say thank you very much to the Convention Oversight Committee. This is turning into an extremely successful convention. Once again, thank you to, for our host in, uh, in New Orleans here. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about myself, I have served as senior staff in four libertarian presidential campaigns. This gives me a very unique perspective when it comes to the National Party, having uh, had most of my focus on national races and having the ability and the privilege to travel across the country meeting libertarians in all sorts of states. In 2016, I served as the ballot access director for the Gary Johnson uh, ticket. I'm, I'm very, very proud of the efforts of all of the libertarians out there, libertarian activists, libertarian petition gatherers, donors. It was a colossal effort that ensured that every single American voter for the first time in two decades had the opportunity to, to, to vote for a libertarian candidate for president. I could not have done that alone and to all of you who held up petition boards, who made calls, who organized, who stayed up until late hours the night before petition turn ins, thank you, because I could not have done that job without you. So why am I here? Well, I'm, I'll tell you why I'm here. I'm here because, frankly, I think that we need to have a Libertarian Party chairperson that has a vision for a party that is growing. We need to stop talking about, well, let's see if we can pull off some Democrats. Oh, let's see if we can pull off some Republicans. Let's start talking about the largest single voting block in this country, and that is independent voters. They are the largest voting block. In addition, they are the fastest growing voter block. Consistently, when people are asked, should there be a third party, they say yes. There is a third party, that's us. We're well on our way to being a major party, but we have to do a better job of reaching out to independent voters because that is the future. And the only way, the only way to change the paradigm of American politics is to elect leaders outside of the two-party system. The Libertarian Party is the best and only way that will happen. Thank you, Christopher. Over to you, Joshua. Thank you, thank you. Libertarians, what's going on, guys? Yeah, baby. I'm happy to be up here, trust me. It's been eight months and it's been a wild roller coaster. I've been, I've been to 21 states in the last five months and 17 state conventions. I don't know that there's ever been a chair candidate that's done that. Nick has? Have you done that? Uh, I've seen many of your faces, and, and I've gotten the opportunity to really put my finger on the pulse of this party and find out what can help us be more successful. I want you to know that today you will hear tons of attacks on this stage on me. There is no doubt about that. If you've been following this race at all, it has been insane for all of us. You might hear about my child support. Someone up here might try to tell you that I don't care about my kids, that's false. I've gone through the family law system like many other men in America, in fact millions that have been destroyed by the family court and I came out on the other side a stronger man that still cared about his family. You're gonna hear that I can't hold a job, that's false. I decided I'd become an entrepreneur so I can focus all of my time on this party because that's what's important to me. So 
So don't let those attacks deter you. I am the only person in this race that has laid out a plan for the last eight months to make this party more successful. In those last eight months, I've come up with a pretty solid blueprint for success. I've talked about marketing and fundraising, something that this party has historically done horrendously. There is no doubt about that. No one in here can ignore that. I want to build a fundraising committee. Our best fundraisers in this country can raise money for our candidates like no one's business, and we never set them down and say, how can we be more successful? <laughs> the same goes for marketing. I've talked about building coalitions. I've already started doing that. I've gone out and built coalitions with some of the biggest crypto communities in this country. <laughs> Candidate education. We have to train our candidates before we try to run 2,000 people across this country. They need help. I want to take this last 15 seconds to say that I appreciate all my competitors up here. You've all done something good for the movement, even you, Matt. Thank you very much, and let's get to work. All right, three minutes on the clock for Nicholas. Hello, Libertarians. It's so nice to see you again. Four years ago in Columbus, I stood in front of the Libertarian National Convention and I said that it had been too long that we had been stagnant, that we had plateaued as a party that the Liberty Movement was growing and the Libertarian Party was not, and that it was time for a change. And in 2014, I asked you to elect me to be the least important person in the Libertarian Party. And I was honored when you put faith in someone who had never been on the Libertarian National Committee. Sure, I had been a state chair and a state vice chair. Sure, I had recruited an entire ballot full of candidates with the help of Joe Johnson in Colorado. Sure, we had passed Amendment 64 in Colorado, the first recreational law in the United States to legalize cannabis. Sure, I had been to every national convention since the year 2000 but I had never been on the National Committee. And a lot of people in this room did not vote for me then because I didn't have the experience. And in 2016 in Orlando, a lot of those same people saw the incredible growth that we had from 2014 to 2016, where we had 50 state ballot access for the first time in 16 years. We had professional fundraising, we had growth across all areas, and we nominated the most successful presidential ticket in Libertarian Party history. And I asked you then to re-elect me to be the least important person in the Libertarian Party so that I could work to empower you to go out and be those most important people in the Libertarian Party. And in the last two years, we've had more fundraising growth. This convention is now double the size of the 2014 convention, both for packages sold and money raised. And I think you all deserve a round of applause. If you look at the graph for the last four years, the trend is up at all levels. And I want to continue that success and with your trust, I ask you to re-elect me to be the least important person in the Libertarian Party. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. It is time to move on to the questions, and I've been told that the answers are one minute long. Is that right? I think that's right. If I'm wrong, yes, that's right. I have the confirmation. Right. 
So as I said earlier, the first question comes from you, the audience, and it is this. Oh, and it will be going, yes. First to, no, we're going to uh, change the order. So the first one now is Christopher. Okay. okay, thank you. Goes as follows. The chair position is unpaid. How will you fund your personal travels and accommodations to fulfill the expectations of a national party leader? And again, we begin with Christopher and then go, we'll go to Joshua. So over to you, Christopher. It's to you, Chris. Is it? Okay. So, uh, yeah, interesting question. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I have worked as a political consultant for many, many years. Uh, I have also worked as an entrepreneur. I, I do uh, a significant amount of marketing for small businesses as well. Uh, I have no doubt I will be able to fulfill those obligations. I also have the ability and the, uh, the freedom to travel uh, near, on a near consistent basis. Interestingly enough, um, I'm actually sitting now with the Connecticut delegation at this convention. The convention before that, I was sitting with the California delegation. Convention before that, I was sitting with the New Jersey delegation. Convention before that, I was sitting with the delegation from my home state of North Carolina. So again, I have a unique national perspective and an ability to travel this nation, and as a chair, I would uh, absolutely love the opportunity to talk about the Libertarian Party in my travels. All right, Joshua Smith. Yeah, absolutely. So in my opening, I talked about how I put my whole life on hold for this campaign because this party is the most important thing to me. So what I did was I let go of my normal nine to five job and I became an entrepreneur. I started my own business. I've been working in the uh, rental property maintenance business on the side for the last 10 years and decided I had enough business and enough work to uh, start my own business. And so that gives me the freedom to travel, it gives me the freedom to set my own schedule, and it gives me the money that I need to make sure that I get to states that need our help. That's basically it. Thank you guys, I'll yield the floor. Thank you, Joshua. Our timer is reset, so over to you, Nick. Who's next? You. Oh, good, all right. Gosh, how will I be able to travel around and be the chair of the National Committee? <laughs> I'm probably going to do it pretty much the same way that I've done it for the last four years. I make the time and I take the time to go around the country wherever I'm needed to speak at rallies, to speak at state conventions, to attend every National Committee meeting, to attend every National Convention. I have a comfortable life. Uh, we have a small business. I'm working a full-time job. My wife, Valerie, and our four kids are back there. It's worked for us for four years now, and it'll probably continue to work for the next two. So when it comes to knowing what the job entails and how hard it can be and whether or not I know how to do it, I can assure you it won't be a problem. All right, and over to Matt. One minute. Okay, so for me, I'm, I'm married, we, we own our home, I work pretty much 50, 60 hours a week, uh, I, I do uh, facility maintenance, mostly HVAC, large commercial equipment, uh, my wife's going through nursing school, she has one year left, uh, so we're surviving on my income and we're pretty lucky to be able to survive on one income these days uh, with, our, with our age bracket, millennials aren't typically able to survive off one income. Uh, so honestly, unless I start a GoFundMe, I'm not gonna be able to, so please don't vote for me. <laughs> All right. Interesting strategy. Okay, here's the second audience question. And we're gonna be starting, this question uh, goes to Joshua Smith. Joshua, how would you, as chair, deal with a libertarian candidate who you feel harms the party or the cause of liberty? Ooh, that's a rough one, huh? <laughs> LOL, okay. Uh, look, I, I think if someone's harming our activism and they're harming the party and they're harming other candidates, 
And I've just traveled the country and heard this story time and time again, but it wasn't from a candidate. It was from a vice chair. I would make sure that I set that person down and let them know that if they continue to do that, we're gonna find a way to stop it. Because that's what leadership does, that's what leadership should always do, is make sure that the brand is okay and that we're not hurting other people's activism. Thank you. Thank you. Quiet, please. Hey, everyone, we're going to keep this respectful. This is for us to hear the candidates, not for the candidates to hear you. <laughs> Joshua, thank you. Nick, over to you. All right. When you have, repeat the question, please, real quick. Okay, the question is, how would you as chair deal with a libertarian candidate who you feel harms the party or the cause of liberty? So the answer to that is you talk to the candidate. If the candidate's doing something that isn't right, you talk to them. You try to put out a message that differentiates. We did this when we had a candidate running for president who said things about a no-fly list and firearms rights that didn't align with the Libertarian Party platform. But what we didn't do was we didn't call them out publicly, we didn't renounce the ticket, the National Party put out a statement clarifying our position on gun rights. When a candidate says something that's off message or off platform, if you draw attention to it, you damage the party. And as chair, the party is paramount. All right, over to Matt Kino. Okay. So, obviously, as, as myself, I'm running for state representative as an anarcho-communist, and a lot of people feel like that hurts their campaigns or, or that somehow I'm, I'm a threat to them. And I feel the same way sometimes when it comes to the alt-right and the, these hard-right candidates. But to me, the only way that you effectively oppose that is by being the example, by being the better candidate, by supporting candidates that you believe are better candidates. Put, make their voices louder, make your voice louder. All right. Thank you, Matt. Over to you, Christopher. Do you need the question again, or are you good? I, I, I think I've, I can uh, roll with it here. Now, this is an interesting question because we're asking about candidates. The role of the national chair is certainly to keep uh, a, a message of libertarianism on platform coming from the national office. However, I would have to defer to the state in which that candidate is running because there are only so many things that national can do. It is up to the states to make a decision whether to repudiate or whether to uh, perhaps uh, make an effort to remove somebody from the ballot. That is up to the state parties. However, I do agree with the current chair in saying that it must come from the national party that, hey, this is not what we believe. If it gets particularly egregious, something has to be said. Unfortunately, I do feel like a situation with a certain vice chair, that didn't really come from the National Party, and that was the place of the National Party. Thank you. So now over to the third question from the audience. And it will be uh, Nick who will be the first person to answer this. The question is as follows. What efforts would you prioritize to get the LP ready for the 2020 campaign? Nick. All right. So what efforts I am prioritizing to get the LP ready for the 2018 camp, for the 2020 campaign? Yes. For the 2020 campaign is the efforts that we're doing in the 2018 campaign. The reason to recruit 2,000 candidates nationwide, and by the way, I will fail, we'll probably only have a few over 1,000, is to set the stage for the best presidential nominating convention we've ever had in Austin 2020. I know that there are people in this room who are not happy with the likely nominees for the 2020 presidential nomination. The way to fix that is not to try and twist the arm of Drew Carey or Penn Jillette or whoever your pipe dream is. The way to fix that 
is to build this party into such a political force through fundraising and doing well in elections that better people want to run for our nomination. All right, over to Matt Keenell, one minute. I, th I think the LNC does a lot of good things for our candidates, but I feel like there's only so much that uh, a central committee can do for our candidates, especially when we're playing on the Republican and Democrat field, which is money and advertising, and we just can't compete. Uh, to me, it's that grassroots, and that, that comes down to the states, and that comes down to propping up and, and creating, if you need to, your local affiliates. You need to have a ground game, a grassroots uh, effort can have way more effect than any amount of money that a candidate wants to throw it out. If you have people on the ground, you have people knocking on doors, you have candidates on everybody's ballot in that state, uh, that is more effective than hoping that the LNC itself is able to propel that, that candidate to success. It takes everybody on the ground working together. Thank you, Matt. So Christopher, over to you. Thank you. So first and foremost, the question is what efforts to prioritize? While of course growing membership with an outrage to independent voters is huge and fundraising development is also huge, what I think is very important and something that we're not doing right now is focusing on a plan for ballot access. Most of my job in 2016 as a ballot access director for Gary Johnson's campaign unfortunately consisted of going and putting out fires. We have the data. We know what we need to do in order to maintain ballot access and to get it in the, in the states that we have to petition. The ballot access committee, head, headed by Mr. Ken Molman, who actually, by the way, also put together this debate, so cheers to him for this. Uh, now, on that ballot access committee, we delivered a report about yay big to the national committee, detailing every single aspect that we had to go through in order to achieve that 50 state ballot access. From that, a plan could have been developed that could be already in motion. Instead, we're still, we're already putting out All fires right. right now. Thank you very much. Thanks for the music. That was, that was good. Nice touch. Uh, thanks, Christopher. On to you, Joshua. One minute. Yeah, absolutely. We, I'm glad that the current chair talked about fundraising. That's the first time I've heard him actually say it in person. I think that fundraising is going to be so, so important going into 2020. We're working with less than $2 million right now. We can't exist as a national political party on $2 million. We just cannot do it anymore. It's insane to think that we can. 18 years ago, we had a $3 million budget, and now we have half of that. We gotta stop. We gotta start focusing on marketing. Marketing is so important, especially digital marketing today. It's the digital era. We don't focus on, on it at all. And we need to build a base for our down ballot candidates around the country because grassroots means everything to this party. We will have a successful 2020 if we have successful down ballot candidates going into the election. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joshua. And just to remind the candidates, if you do want more time, if you want an extra 30 seconds, play your rebuttal card and we're happy to accommodate you. All right, here's the fourth question from the audience, and I guess we are going to Matt Keenel for this one. What work would you do to convince elected officials of other parties to switch to our party, assuming that they're aligned with our statement of principles? Honestly, it's, it's tough because I don't know if, how many are really aligned with our principles. Uh, <laughs> so to me, it's more about fostering, like I said, you get people engaged in your community. You get normal people up there, the ones that you can trust that aren't going to be corrupted when, once they get into the game of politics because it's so easy uh, to start having people give you money and then you feel obligated and then you start taking on different positions and you change. Uh, so I think it's really about education first. You educate people on the libertarian ideals, and then you give them the tools to go out there and be candidates. Uh, but otherwise, I think just being successful, having ballot access, and having a platform that's attractive could sway some people our way, but I'm not sure if that's the best way to success. Thank you, Matt. 
Christopher, over to you. While I applaud the efforts that have been undertaken over the past few years with trying to get sitting elected officials over to the Libertarian Party, frankly, that's not my priority. My priority is electing libertarians. Once again, I said this before, the only way to change the paradigm of electoral politics in this nation is to elect candidates outside of the two-party system. Those candidates need to be libertarians. We need to give our candidates and our activists the best possible tools and the best possible chance to actually get elected. So while, again, of course I would continue outreach to those who are out there and may share our principles in state legislators and whatnot, I am more interested in electing libertarians so that they do not immediately, uh, once they switch, you know, yeah, it's great when you get somebody who's, who's about to retire and you get somebody who, you know, uh, now all of a sudden gets primaried. No, we need to give the tools to ensure that we elect libertarians, and that would be my priority as chair. All right, thank you, Christopher. Joshua. What do you think about Bill Wells? Is that the question? I actually agree with Chris. I think we should be focused on getting ele uh, uh, libertarians elected. Absolutely, 100%, that's great. I think the single most important thing we can do if we're thinking about flipping already elected officials to the Libertarian Party is to get our current elected officials re-elected. Let's give a round of applause for Brandon and Caleb Dyer and Laura Epke because those are important to our party. I'm very much from the school of Larry Sharp in this aspect. I will sit down with anybody in this country that wants to talk about liberty from any party, any background, and any walk of life, and I will sell them the ideals that we're trying to sell daily. And that is how we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Nick, your turn. So, over the last four years, we have had more elected officials switch to become libertarian and leave their old parties behind than ever before in national party history. So while the other gentlemen on the stage can either talk about how it's not important or talk about how they would do it, I'm going to tell you how we do do it. We sit down and we have the conversations with people who are not happy in their old parties. When we have to fly to Washington, D.C. to be deposed by the FEC, we take a trip over to Capitol Hill to meet with a congressman from Michigan. When we go to a state convention and the state chair says, I have a state representative who's really unhappy with their old party, we take the time to go and sit down with them and talk to them about the Libertarian Party. We reach out and we ask. That's how we bring people in at all levels, whether they're switching, or we're recruiting, or we're fundraising. Thank you, Nick. I almost want to ask the candidates to go overtime so we get to hear what this music actually is, but, uh, <laughs> but I can't do that. What I can do is ask the fifth question from the audience, and this will go first to Christopher. It is as follows. Is the danger of a takeover of the LP by left or right wing collectivists real or imagined? How do you address the concern? Christopher. The concept of a takeover of the LP, I think, is, is slightly blow, blown out of proportion. Uh, I would say, once again, we have a statement of principles. That statement of principles says what we're about. But again, we do a very poor job of letting the independent voters out there know that we're prob they're probably more aligned with us, certainly, than any of the other two parties. Uh, I think that the idea, again, of a takeover, is, it doesn't make much sense to me. What's happening is that we're attracting all sorts of different people who realize that 99% of the time, their gripe with the establishment is because government. I say again, I came from the left and I was very angry at the way things were. That's why I was a young uh, leftist activist, if you will. It was only, until, only when I started looking at why things are the way they are that I realized, once again, it's because government. I knew I was a libertarian then. We just have to let people know they're libertarians. All right, thank you, Christopher. 
Sorry, should I kept should I you know keep going? I, I know this is this is keeping us all in suspense at the well, moment. Well, you can so. always play your your yeah. You're right. <laughs> uh, and just a reminder, you do you guys do have four rebuttal cards there. I haven't seen one played yet. I'm kind of curious to see one of those played eventually. Um, but on to you, Joshua Smith. A minute on the timer. Is it possible? Sure, absolutely. Our party is half the numbers it was 18 years ago when we had Harry Brown, who cared about principle. Currently, we have a confirmed communist running for chair of this party on stage. It's absolutely possible. And until we grow this party with libertarians, it will continue to be possible. And that's why I say my first month as chair, I will reaffirm our principles, including property rights, and make sure that this country knows what we stand for. Okay. He said all there is to say. That's my rebuttal. Thank you, Joshua. Over to you, Nick. I threw my card. What, what? Oh, we do have a. I didn't even see that. Can you Matt? It didn't go far. But yeah, I would like to rebut that. Uh, yeah, I'm a oh. com communist running for chair. Uh, the the uh, takeover that we should be afraid of is authoritarians. I am not an authoritarian communist. I am for complete anarchy. And that is what communism is it's stateless, it's classless, it's absent market. And yeah, it can be used as a tool for authoritarianism, but that is not my ideal. All right. Thank you, Matt. That, well, everybody, hey, come on, everybody, look. We're, we're already running over time here. Let's calm down. I'm sure you can all get passionate about this stuff over dinner later. Just hold tight. Try to be more okay. British is what he's trying to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, basically be like the English. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, okay. <laughs> Nick? Over to you, sir. So I've been around in this party for nearly 20 years, and people have been afraid of a takeover for almost an entire time. And they've been spending more time worried about the communists or the alt-rightists or the Republicans or the Democrats who are under the bed than in building the party into something that would be worth taking over. And I stopped worrying about who's trying to get in and I started inviting people in because the fear of a takeover comes from a fundamental misconception that some people in this party have that I don't share, which is the idea that the Libertarian Party's values and our platform are too weak to suffer contact with people that don't agree with us on everything. And I think we, as Libertarians and Libertarianism, are more powerful than any ideology that might come in that door. All right, all right. Okay, thank you, Nick. Okay, we're going back over to Matt. You got have a minute to answer this question. Matt, go ahead. The only way that this party could ever be taken over, and, and again, it's not a left or right thing, it's an authoritarian thing. The only way it could ever be taken over is if good people leave this party. So what we need to do is stick around. We need to make sure we're, we're here for that fight. We need to make sure we're in, we're in that fight in our states, in our county, and make sure that we are promoting the ideals that we believe are the most ethical. There's always going to be, and just, just like communists, just like libertarianism, people will use our language. They will distort our, our ideals to match theirs. They will exploit it, and they will give us a bad name. But that's on us to be even louder, be even prouder, and be even more libertarian than they could ever try to pretend to be. All right, our final question from the audience, and we are going to Joshua Smith with this one first. How should the LP 
most effectively exploit the current disillusionment with the political status quo? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Okay. How should the Libertarian Party most effectively exploit the current disillusionment with the political status quo? Well, we talked about it earlier. The independent block is a very important block, but, but there's another block we aren't really talking about. There's 60% of the voters or of the non-voters in this country are not voting. They're just not. And we need to reach out to those people and we need to set ourselves apart from the status quo by reaffirming our principles, by showing that we don't support them, we don't support their candidates, and being the second party, not the third party. Thank you. All right, Joshua, thank you. Well, and first once party, again, party. over to you, Nick. It's, it's long, so can you repeat it? I'm sorry, it's sure. a long question. How should the LP most effectively exploit the current disillusionment with the political status quo? Okay, so when I talk to major donors who have come over from either the Republican or Democratic parties or were not affiliated before, the biggest reason they come over is not because they're hardcore libertarians, believe it or not. The reason they come over is that they neither trust the Republicans nor the Democrats to live up to the principles that they profess to espouse long, long ago. They can't believe them anymore. They're liars. <laughs> Being bold with our principles and how we are neither left nor right, but we are free. Free on all issues all the time. Always up, never down. Always for the individual liberty and never for government control. And they believe us. They know that we are authentic and that's why fundraising has gone up. That's why people are switching parties. That's why we have more candidates running. That's what's making us successful. All right. Thank you, Nick. Uh, over to you, Matt. I, I think where the major parties stay, and, and I see it, uh, some of our candidates try to take this route, is uh, by offering compromises. And we don't want to offer compromises. We want to make demands. So we want to connect with our voters and make the demands that they want to see. Uh, for one, abolish ICE. That is huge right now. Abolish ICE and you will get your message out. Uh, another one, end the police state. That is a message people want to hear right now. So you be loud about it. Uh, another one, and some of you might not agree with it, rent is theft. We have We have rent at such high rates that the poor can't afford to survive. Rent assistance is subsidies for the rich. Let, whoa, 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 whoa. Right. Hold on. That is, look, look. I, you may not agree with everything you hear up on this stage. That is the whole point, right? So Matt, so Matt, you were drowned out for 15 seconds. If you would like to repeat the last 15 seconds, I hope that the people in front of you will give you the courtesy of hearing it. Go ahead. What I'm trying to say is, the problems my constituents face may not be yours. Stop and you it. have to find out what it is that your constituents are concerned about, and you have to offer solutions. And you may not like my solutions for my constituents, but you gotta find your own. Thank you, Matt. All right, yeah. Try to be a little bit more English, will you? All right. We, oh, we're starting. <clears throat> no, we, we, we did it. Okay, over to you, Christopher. Thank you. Uh, apologies, my answer is probably not going to invoke that uh, drastic of a reaction, but uh, the question is, how should we exploit the disillusionment, disillusionment with the current establishment? Well, again, I've got a boring answer for you. We have to do a better job of taking care of the business of the party. We have to do a better job of putting in place the systems that are necessary to give our candidates and our activists the best possible chance for success. We have to do things like uh, develop clear and concise messaging. 
We have to use professional marketing. We need to stop the reliance on 80s and 90s tactics. We still do a whole lot of direct mail, and yes, it can be successful. However, we should be spending a whole lot more on online marketing than we are on direct mail. It is time that the Libertarian Party grows up, becomes a professional political party, utilizing the tools of the 21st century in order to stoke this disillusionment, because it's there. They need to know that we're here. Thank you, Christopher. Now, I think we've got this right. We're moving on now to the first moderator's question. Tim and I spent a long time in the room over there coming up with these. It was fun. You're not going to get all of the ones we came up with, but here's a few. Starting with you, Nick. The question is, what do the terms purism and pragmatism mean to you and to the Libertarian Party? One minute? One minute. <laughs> All right. There has been, and some of you may have heard this before, a long argument between purists and pragmatists in the party. On this stage, you see the argument between people on the left and people on the right in this party. These are not important distinctions. There is one distinction that's very important in the Libertarian Party, and that's between being a nice person and being a jerk. And I don't care if you're a purist or a pragmatist, if you're less left or right. I can teach a nice person about libertarianism, but a jerk's a jerk's a jerk. <laughs> so what we need to see more of in this party is more people being kind to one another and working on what they love, and fewer people tearing others down. All right, thanks, Nick. Over to Matt. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Absolutely. What do the terms purism and pragmatism mean to you and to the Libertarian Party? To me, I, I feel like they are just sometimes tools people use to, uh, to fight. I find uh, some people who consider themselves purists uh, to reject some of my purist stances, like abolish private property. Uh, so, yeah, all of a sudden people want the state involved Point in of property order. rights. Uh, so, so I think it's just a tool that people use, and I think there are pragmatic positions that people can take. Uh, like, my pragmatic position is Medicare for all. I think that resonates with people. So I think you, Be nice. I think you need a healthy balance of principles, and I think you need a healthy balance of pragmatism, and I think when you use that appropriately, when you have that good balance, you will more resonate with more people. So is rent. All right, you seem to be done, Matt. So uh, we will move on to Christopher, and I think the new rule is if somebody gets drowned out for 10 seconds, they get 20 seconds extra, so you have to listen to them for longer. Right. So, Puritism Bo versus pragmatism. Here's, here's the thing. I like to joke that I swung so far to the left, I ended up on the right. But the reality is I just realized I was a libertarian. Liberals call me conservative and conservative call me liberals. I think I'm liberal. I think I'm doing the right thing. But I'll, I'll tell you right now, I'm, I am uh, I moved to mention somebody who is not here with us because it is a, an individual who was, uh, was, was very near to, dear to my heart. He was a good man, and we are here honoring Dr. Feldman, one, one presidential candidate, uh, former presidential candidate, but there's, there's another former libertarian presidential candidate, one who I think would, uh, would be okay with being called a, a pragmatist, and his name was uh, Lee Wright. I considered Lee a friend, though I rarely agreed with him, though I rarely agreed with him, and I think the thing that we had in common is the thing that all of us, I'm throwing my card so the music can stop here, just for the record, all right. We have to remember what we have in common, and what we have in common is a love of freedom, both for ourselves and for our fellow humans. That's what makes us libertarians. That's what unifies us in this room. All right. Thank you, Christopher. 
Uh, Joshua, on to you. Awesome, thank you. I am going to invoke two sayings that I've heard from two other people. A good friend of mine once said, it's not about pragmatists and anarchists. It's about the, it's about the talkers and the doers. Another good friend of mine once said, we're on a 3,000 mile journey. We're at exit three and we're arguing about the last three exits. Who cares? We got work to do. We're going in the same direction. Let's get it done. Let's figure out the blueprint and start getting to work. Thank you. All right, we're on to the next question. And just a reminder, uh, booing is theft of their time. So. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, the, the next question is to Matt Keenel. Does the internal culture of the party need to change? If so, what is the role of the chair in changing it? Uh, absolutely none. Uh, the, the culture of the party is made up by the membership. Uh, I, I don't think there's a real need for a culture shift, um, but, but I think we do need to catch up with the times a bit. Uh, I think we do need to uh, encourage new members, uh, young members. I think we need to uh, get, get the youth involved uh, while they're young. Uh, that's when you get brand loyalty. Um, so I think when we try to lure, uh, you know, establish people who have been voting Democrat or Republican their whole lives, it, it's, the success rate of that is too low. Uh, what we need to do is really aim for the, for the youth vote, uh, and I go as far as uh, under 18. I think we should oppose age limits to voting, and I think we should appeal to young children. Anybody who wants to participate in the system, and anybody who's having laws written about them in this system, deserves a voice. Thank you, Matt. Moving on to you, Christopher. Uh, I'd like you to repeat the question. I want to be absolutely clear sure. on what's being asked here. The question is, does the internal culture of the party need to change? If so, what is the role of the chair in changing it? The question of if culture needs to change, well, I'll tell you what. I've been coming to conventions since 2008. I see a lot of old friends. I see a lot of faces that I recognize. And I see a lot of faces that I don't. It's clear to me that we do have new people coming in every time. So if you ask, does it need to change, it already is because, again, we're bringing new people in. We're letting people know that they are libertarians. They probably just didn't know it until somebody actually told them, hey, this is what we believe. And then we said, hey, here's another option besides the two-party system. That's what we have to focus on. Again, I, I, these questions, some of them I think are a little off the rails for what we really need to be talking about. We need to be talking about how we're going to grow the party, how we're actually going to put the systems in place in the inner workings of the party in order to give our activists and our candidates the best possible chance to win. It is about electing libertarians and it is about enticing independent voters across this nation to remind them that they are in fact libertarians. We Is that almost heard it. I can't tell. Uh, all right, thank you, Christopher. You know, I kind of feel bad about these questions that we came up with. Maybe they weren't the greatest, but uh, anyways. Uh, moving on to Joshua, you have a minute. You know, I think that's a really loaded question, to be honest with you. There's several different cultures in this party. I think that a national leadership team needs to set an example for our state affiliates, needs to set an example for our local affiliates. And I believe that the LNC culture can absolutely use a change. I think, yeah. I think hateful rhetoric needs to be pushed aside, and I think we need to fill that time with work ethic. I think we need to fill that time with getting candidates elected at all levels of office across the entire nation and making our party much more successful. Thank you. I see you have a rebuttal card played by Matt. Yes, I'd Go like ahead. to rebut that. Go ahead, you have 30 seconds. Um, what I don't understand is how anybody could believe somebody who's never ran a campaign, never uh, been a campaign manager, never got anybody elected before, is gonna get this party national success at that level. That is completely unrealistic from the person who's coming from.
and I think Thank you, it's over to you, Nick, All to right. answer this question. The internal culture of the Libertarian Party doesn't need to change. I've seen Libertarians offer up their houses, their funds, their food to help people attend this convention who couldn't afford it. I've seen people cross all of these ideological aisles that people say exist in this party because Libertarians are not just a political party, we are family and we love each other. And I take exception at the idea that the LNC culture needs to change because I have had the honor to serve with two terms of the LNC with some of the most devoted people to building this party and working together and working forward even when we disagree that I've seen in watching 20 years worth of LNCs. The way the chair does it is the chair shows an example. You lead by example. Libertarians follow. You cannot push them. Thank you, Nick. And if I've kept track of this, we are now on to the final moderator's question that will go first to Christopher. And the question is this. Should Tim Moen and his libertarians form a government in Canada? Should the decision as to joining the Canadian Federation be left to the states? Starting with you, Christopher. Good sir, I must confess, I was not able to hear what you said. However, That's a damn shame I gathered because it, it was, was a pretty great funny. question. I will read it again. Okay. Should Tim Moen and his libertarians form a government in Canada? Should the decision as to joining the Canadian Federation be left to the states? Okay, well, you know, I'm going to respectfully shift and uh, I, I just got to tell you, although I appreciate the question, I'm not sure I'm the best qualified to answer that because I'm sitting here or standing here as it were, and I'm running for chair of the Libertarian National Party. I'm worried about getting Libertarians elected. I'm worried about getting the things done that is necessary, once again, to elect libertarians. That's what we're here to talk about. That's what we're here to talk about. And respectfully, respectfully, I, I will say that uh, people should have the, uh, the right to, uh, to choose just about all their associations. That's what volunteerism is, and that is a, that is a principle of the Libertarian Party. Thank you, Christopher. Joshua Smith, you I'm joined the Canadian not Federation to or talk what? about Canadian politics, but I will say this. I followed Tim Moen for a long time. I'm a big fan, actually. Thank you for this. And I think Tim Moen and his libertarians should be able to do whatever they want as long as they're not harming or taking somebody else's property. Thank you. Short and simple. Over to you, Nick. That's it. That's it. That's all I got, man. So, should Tim managed to form a government in Canada. One, I'd be kicking myself, because why the hell did we let the Canadians get out in front of us? <laughs> but I'll also say what I said when I spoke at the Libertarian Party of Washington Convention in Vancouver. Joshua wasn't there, but Tim Moen was. And I said that if Tim Moen ever moves south of the border and naturalizes, I'm immediately going to run him for LNC chair because he's taller, he's more attractive, and he's a goddamn hero. Pretty good, pretty good answer. But uh, I see Joshua threw out his rebuttal card. Go ahead. I did. Am I, I did. not good looking? What, what are you going to rebut here? <laughs> One more time, Tim. What'd you say? No, you got 30 seconds. Oh, go great, ahead and rebut. I didn't live in Washington at the time, Nick. Thank you very much. But I just went to 17 state conventions across the country, and I saw you at three. I appreciate it. All right. And we're heading over to Matt. Matt, you joining the Canadian Federation? All right. I really thought going last was going to help me with this question, but I'm still pretty, <laughs> still pretty lost. Uh, but anyways. 
I don't know, whenever you talk about states' rights, uh, I hate that. I hate states' rights. I, I think that's because it doesn't go far enough. We, we are against the state. We are against states. States don't have rights. Individuals have rights. And whatever we can do to maximize those freedoms, we do. So as far as uh, the libertarians in Canada forming a government, I don't know, it just sounds bad. It sounds bad. But you know what? If it equals more liberty for Canadians, it might not be bad. So we, we'll see. All right. Was that everyone? Yeah, that's everyone. Yes. Okay, now we're on to the fun part here. So each candidate will have two questions. They're going to ask them uh, one at a time, do the first round of questions, and then we'll go to the next question and do another round. Um, each candidate has one question to ask another candidate. And we are starting with Joshua Smith. So I have one question to ask one candidate. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, Nick, what do you think about Bill Weld? I think one minute. One minute to answer. All right. Thank you, guys. What I think about Bill Weld is that he is still in the Libertarian Party when many of his opponents were not. That he goes around the country raising money for and endorsing Libertarian candidates that he fundraises for us, and that the exposure of Bill Weld to the Libertarian Party has not made the Libertarian Party more like an establishment Republican, but it's made Bill Weld a lot more like a Libertarian. The other thing I think about Bill Weld is that he knows something about winning public office and that we should be willing to learn how to do that from anybody who will help us, anybody who will join us, and we should not push people out who are willing to help because of our ideology. Carry on, Nick. Carry on. And I'm going to ask Joshua. Oh, hold on, we have a rebuttal card played. Yeah, well. I played it. Oh, you played it. Sorry. <laughs> People come to this party at one convention to get one thing, one nomination, and they leave. And this is Joshua's first convention. And we'll see what he does after this one convention. Was it a question or not? Nope. Okay. And uh, Nick, it's still with you to ask a question of one of your fellow candidates on the stage. I get the opportunity? You now get to ask a question of any one of your fellow candidates on the stage. My question is for Joshua. <laughs> you have said that you have a plan for making fundraising $4 million. You've said that you have a plan for viral marketing. You have a plan to bring our party to a new level. And this is not a job that you can learn while you're doing it. So I'm going to ask, what experience do you have in raising money, electing candidates, building parties, chairing meetings, or any of the relevant tasks that this job requires? Oh, you got the music. Go ahead, Joshua. Oh, I appreciate the question, Nick. Uh, I don't have the relevant experience. I've talked about that actually over the last eight months. That's fine. But I've been able to build a team, <laughs> coalitions with the crypto community, people that are in this room like Nexus Earth, Jim Cantrell from Vector Space Systems. I've been able to start building a policy team so we can artfully craft a libertarian message that the, the population can digest. Uh, I've, I've been able to travel to 17 states. I, I went to Oklahoma on 15 minutes notice and I was able to chair their state convention. It's not always about experience, Nick. It's about vision. It's about ideas. It's about coalition building. It's about a blueprint for success. And I've already started doing these things and I know they will be successful. Thank you. Hard. 
All right, we had a rebuttal card thrown by Nick, so 30 seconds on the clock for Nick. I've heard a lot about coalitions and outreach and teams, but I've heard nothing about your county party. How many members does it have and how many did it used to have? Your campaign for public office, why did you stop and who did you recruit to replace you? Your state party, what fundraising you've done for anything other than your own race for chair? All right, and now we go over to Matt Keenell for your question. You can ask any of your fellow candidates any question you want. Okay, my question is for Joshua, uh, who, who often calls me a violent collectivist. Uh, he calls me a statist, which isn't true. Uh, yet Joshua has uh, sent me an email and a document that's threatening me with a lawsuit for $80,000 of losses for this volunteer position he's running in. And he's also threatening me with federal charges for blackmail after being endorsed by the guy who wrote the book called Legalized Blackmail. <laughs> so Joshua, do you continue, or do you plan on continuing to threaten me with the state after this, or will it be over? All right, one minute on the clock. Go ahead and answer, Joshua. Let's, let's just ask, what kind of candidate for an unpaid position would try to blackmail another candidate? How about we ask that question? That's the more, more important question. What are you scared of, Matt? Look, I sent a soft draft of a lawsuit over to over this gentleman because he decided he was going to try and release my business's private chats. Business talk. If I didn't drop out of this race a week before this convention, there'd still be civil suits, even if we had a completely voluntary society. I was letting him know that that wasn't okay, that wasn't a good practice, that's not what we want in the Libertarian Party. You could be mad at me about it if you want, that's fine. I'd do it again. Thank you, I appreciate that. That's it. Yeah. All right, we have a rebuttal card played by Matt. Go ahead, Matt, 30 seconds. I understand Joshua's new at this, but, but when you run for office, you open yourself up to public scrutiny. And, and when you run as an, a libertarian, you're supposed to be running for a, a, an accountable and transparent government. So if you can't be transparent and accountable yourself, and if a whistleblower sends private chats full of homophobic speech and threats of overthrowing the Libertarian Party, they wouldn't be relevant if you weren't running for this chair. So welcome to politics. We, we've had a rebuttal card played by Christopher. So Christopher, over to you. What we are witnessing at this moment <laughs> is exactly why I made the decision to run for chair. <laughs> I have watched as this race has devolved into bitter name calling and getting so far from the subject of, at hand, which is once again, how do we elect libertarians? Enough of this. Let's get back to talking about how we do the business of the party and how we give our candidates and our activists the best possible chance for success. It is not through personal attacks. It is not from, from going back and forth up here on the stage, wasting everybody's time talking about personal bickering. Respectfully, gentlemen, let's get back to the task at hand. How are we going to elect libertarians? Thank you. And Christopher, it is actually, Christopher, it is actually your turn, I believe, to ask a question of any of your fellow candidates. You might choose that one. Over to you, Christopher, again. My question is to the esteemed chair. And I would preface this by saying, uh, Mr. Sarwak, I have uh, the utmost respect for you, I truly do. But my question to you, is there anything, say, at the 2016 National Convention, or in your second term as chair, that you would do differently, given the opportunity? Anything at the... Over to you, Nick, one minute. There's a lot of things that I would do differently. I would have tried to bring on candidate support and recruitment staff earlier. 
Uh, we started too late, and that's why we're going to hit 1,000 candidates instead of 2,000. I would have tried to build up, you know, have a full-time press secretary earlier. Part of the thing that is tough about being chair of the LNC is that you're not really in charge. You are really the least important person in the party. And so you can go exactly as fast as you, the delegates, and the other members of the LNC want to go. And so in the first term, we added an affiliate support specialist. In the second term, we added a press secretary, two development people, two candidate support and recruitment people, and we started having growth. But the idea that we could go faster than that, you know, I don't think it's possible. I, I think we have to, let me take another 30 seconds. <laughs> We have to work with what people can do. We've never failed a ballot access drive in the entire time that I've been chair, but we've walked away from a couple because there are some state parties that weren't ready to go along with us. We've recruited candidates and some of them have been great and some of them haven't. We've supported candidates and some of them have been great and some of them haven't. I have made mistakes as chair and I will make more mistakes if you elect me again. Because the only way to not make mistakes is to not do anything but I won't make the same mistakes. Okay, we All right, we have a rebuttal there from Christopher. Go ahead, 30 seconds. Mr. Chair, that was a, a good answer, but frankly, it wasn't the one I was hoping for. To be perfectly frank, I have almost no issue with anything that you have done as chair. I have a couple of issues with things you haven't done. I think there have been a couple of opportunities where a chair with an even hand uh, could have made a statement uh, rebutting a, a statement from, say, a rogue vice chair that cost the party dearly in terms of support. All right, we are moving on to the second and final round of candidate questions. We're going to start with Nick. Nick, go ahead and ask any of the candidates a question. Christopher, why is it that the first time anyone in this room heard about you running for chair, or the first time that we've seen you around the Libertarian Party in the last year or so after loudly leaving is tonight? This is a fair question. A year ago, I was working very diligently to try and uh, court a very large donor. I was wondering if I was going to share this story out loud, and I guess I am. Uh, that donor was absolutely appalled at the messaging coming from the national office when it came to a Facebook meme. We decided on, uh, during the Christian Holy Week to share a meme from the Church of Satan. Now, it's not about what that meme said, it's about, the, it's about the symbolism involved here. And I can tell you right now, that turned off somebody who would have put hundreds of thousands of dollars into a race. And you know what? I was a little upset about it because I was really hoping, I was really hoping that perhaps the chair would, would uh, you know, say, okay, maybe we shouldn't have done this. And instead, he chose to really belittle those who, uh, who made an issue with it. That's why. And in fact, in fact, you know, I'm, might as well. Okay, just, go ahead. As we continue him. Yeah, carry on, Christopher. Once again, the reason I made the decision to, uh, to come to this convention uh, was actually, I've got to give credit to Larry Sharp. I saw an interview that Larry gave to Reason Television talking about his gubernatorial run, and one thing he mentioned very specifically was that the Libertarian Party, as flawed as it is, is our best chance to elect leaders outside of the two-party system. Okay, thank you, Christopher. So, Matt, this is your opportunity, your last opportunity to ask a question of any of your fellow candidates. Okay. My question is for Joshua. Shocking. Uh, I want to know why it is that he receives these endorsements from people like Liberty Hangout, uh, recently Augustus Invictus, uh, all these right-leaning authoritarians, and he, 
I want to know why that is and why he doesn't reject them and why he. Br- 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 I, did, I didn't set up Liberty hey, Hangout hey, hey, endorsing no, hey, him. So I'd, I'd like to know why is he? Why does he have such a strong alt-right following? <laughs> you got a minute, Joshua? <laughs> I've been talking smack to Augustus Invictus for two years, and he knew that I was doing it, and he decided to come out today, about a half an hour before this debate, and fake endorse me. I immediately denounced Augustus Invictus. I think he's a dark stain on this party, and I would never accept his support ever. Hold on, I'm not done, Matt. Liberty Hangout is a publication that boasts liberty. And they have been doing this for a long time. They have over 100,000 followers. And a friend of mine and myself have been trying to push them into a more libertarian direction because we like a big platform that can spread real libertarian ideals. So we got them to fire their alt-right people. All of them, all of them. They got rid of all of them. Chase Rochelle's, all of them, they're gone. And they started denouncing Trump and working for a more libertarian cause. And if I could take any platform and move someone in a more libertarian direction. Sorry. Sorry. Hey, 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 can we turn the mute? Excuse me. You know what, I'm fine. You're you're done? That's fine. He threw his card. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, no, I saw the card. It was the music I wanted turned off. That's all right. You're good, okay. Hey, look, okay, look, if I... If we can move any big platform like that into a more libertarian direction, we need to do it. We're not a big party. We need to be bigger. Was there another rebuttal card played during that? There was. Yeah, Matt okay, played one. Matt, please go ahead. I like to say every so often Joshua will come out and say, oh, I, don't, I don't support them, blah, blah, blah. But they still support you, and you don't figure out why. You don't care why. You accept their endorsements no matter what, and just the other day they posted, open borders are communists. (laughs) So they still believe in deporting peaceful people from this country, so they have not moved in a more libertarian direction. Okay, I think this is done and we're moving on now to... All right, we're moving moving on to Christopher. Christopher, it's your last chance to ask your fellow candidates a question, go ahead. You know, I just got to do this. Matt, why are you here? All right, over to Matt. Uh, You have one minute to answer the question. So I I explained earlier, Gary Johnson is what brought me into this party. Uh, But there's a long history before that. Uh, When I was a young teenager and an early adult, I was just a a punk. I lived on the streets, I squatted in houses, I lived in the ghettos, and these are my people. And when I wanted to promote Gary Johnson to them, they didn't want to hear it. Uh, Ron Paul attracted me with his abolishment language and his anti-war, and I wanted to, to figure out a way to get across to the people who I identify with, I found the left libertarian ideals. And I connected with them myself. I identify with them myself. And I'm able to use that to, to promote the same uh, platform, basically. I'm, I'm still in line with the platform of abolishing the government to its maximum. I want it all gone. So that's why I'm here. I feel like this is the party where if you want to abolish the whole state, this is where you do it. All right, and we have uh, another rebuttal card played by Joshua. Joshua, 30 seconds to rebut. Since no one else on this stage is going to say it, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Rent and property are not theft. Thank you, guys. All right, and with that, Joshua, we stay with you. You get to ask the last question of any other candidate on the stage. Awesome, thank you. Nicholas. I've heard you recently start saying that you've made a lot of mistakes. I appreciate that. I think humility is important. What I want to know is, are you sorry for those mistakes? 
to our members. Go ahead, Nick. I wanted to be chair of this party because I have four children in the back of this room and a beautiful wife who I want to grow up in a world that's more free than the one I grew up in. I've taken away thousands of dollars and countless hours from my family and from my work in order to lead this party. And so everything that I have done that has been less than as good as it could be to build up this party is something I'm sorry for. Every missed opportunity is something I'm sorry for. Every time that I have not been good enough for you and I've let you down, it's something I'm sorry for. All I can do is my best. And if you elect me chair again, I will continue to do my best. And if that's not good enough, then you should elect someone else. All right, and that concludes the round of candidate questions. We now move on to the final round, two minute closing statements. And so we're gonna start with Matt. Go ahead and give your two minute closing statement, please. So one group I haven't talked about here much that I'm here to represent is the Audacious Caucus. What the Audacious Caucus has done, and is what we did in the Libertarians of Macomb County, is that we accept our differences. We can agree to disagree in certain areas, and we actually drafted language to ensure that those who are libertarian, whether left or right, have a place in this party. And we get things done. We get work done. What the Audacious is doing is we reject respectability politics. That is our number one issue. It is the one thing we all agree on. We don't wanna be just standard politicians. We don't wanna pretend that we're professionals at this, because we aren't. Most of us are not elected officials. We are individuals, and we are proud of our individualism, and we promote our individualism, and we encourage each member to be an individual. And this is an individualist party. So when you see Audacious getting attacked, and sometimes you know we do attack back, uh, I think we need to mend this divide. I think we need to understand that we, are, we, we deserve a seat at the table. Uh, the Libertarian Socialist Caucus and the Libertarian Party Audacious Caucus, we aren't looking to take over. And if we do take over, it's because we're better at messaging. So, and what we are doing is igniting the youth. We, we are fun, we are exciting, we're funny. We, we promote a political party that's unlike any other. And that is what this party needs to be. It needs to be completely different from anything else out there. And it needs to attract everybody. It needs to be fun, it needs to be inclusive, and it needs to be principled. Okay, thank you, Matt. So it's over to you, Christopher, for your two minute closing statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderators. It's been uh, entertaining, shall we say. Uh, so it has been said that freedom is a two-edged sword. On one edge, liberty, and the other, responsibility. And both edges are exceedingly sharp. The best steel is forged with an even flame. My answers have not popped. They haven't elicited uh, you know, items being thrown at the stage and whatnot. But what I do have to bring to the table is a track record of success. I know what it takes to actually get the nuts and bolts of electoral politics to be successful. I think we have a candidate here who is a, is a good visionary and a great cheerleader. And I think we have a candidate here who is an excellent administrator and parliamentarian. I would like to put forth to you that I'm the best of both worlds. I am here because I know I can do this job. I wouldn't have thrown my hat in the ring at the last minute, and admittedly, it was the last minute. But the reason I did is because I just don't see the other candidates on this stage being able to do both. It is time that the Libertarian Party makes a change because we must grow 
from where we are. It's been said, of course, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. It is time for something new, and that new should be someone with the track record and ability to actually get things done. I've been going to LNC meetings since 2009. I have seen LNC boards come and go. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. I know the actual sausage making when it comes to those board meetings, okay? And I have the ability to espouse a libertarian principled message on the national stage. I've done it before with four different libertarian presidential campaigns. I'm asking for your vote for me, once again, to, uh, see, I knew this thing would come in handy. <laughs> I am asking for your vote, once again, to elect somebody to the position of Libertarian National Chair who is able to both get things done and be that cheerleader to ensure, once again, our candidates and our activists have the best possible chance to get libertarians elected. It is the only way to change the paradigm of politics in this country, and we must get down to the business of actually electing libertarians. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Christopher. Joshua, you have two minutes to close. Thank you guys so much for listening to this great debate. It's been hilarious and awesome and fun. I don't necessarily agree with Mr. Thrasher here. I believe that we need a visionary. I don't think we need an operator. We have parliamentarians. We have administrators. That's what those people do. We need someone with a strong vision and strong ideas to move this party forward. I've committed very hard. I've started building coalitions already. I've started working on a policy team. I've started getting people together in this party that can do things like raising $280,000 for Jeff Hewitt in a, city su or a county supervisor race in Southern California, ready to start raising money for a national party that needs to operate on more than $1.5 million. I've started putting together a real marketing team. Several of those people who have committed are sitting in this room. At the end of the day, I'm a blue collar American human and I've struggled, I have. Some of these people like to bring my struggles up in front of all of you. But I've seen the state put their hand on myself and many other people in this country. And I know that this party is the absolute best venue to push back. And I will not see us fail anymore. I will only be here to make sure that we succeed, no matter the cost. Thank you, guys. Um. For the final statement of the evening, over to you, Nick. When I started as chair in 2014, I was already at my eighth national convention. I've been in this party for a long time and watched a lot of things not get done well, get done okay. Some things were successful, but there was stagnation. Over the last four years, we've had more elected officials switch to the Libertarian Party than ever before. We've added more full-time national staff than we've had going back to that 18-year mark where Joshua thinks that I was chair back then. <laughs> we've started to get back to the success and the optimism that we had at the turn of the century, where we saw a libertarian world that was in front of us. We're seeing candidates around the country raising tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars where candidates in those races historically have raised hundreds, if not maybe thousands of dollars. There is more excitement about the Libertarian Party and our candidates than ever before. We have turned a corner and we are rising to the next level. And the way we are doing that is we are focusing not on personalities, not on fighting with other Libertarians, not on arguments over ideology, but going out and doing the work to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to get ballot access in all 50 states to put candidates on the ballot so a voter doesn't have to go into the booth and have a wasted vote. 
A wasted vote is a vote where you have a person who wants to vote Libertarian and there is no Libertarian on their ballot. No more will we have those wasted votes. No more will we have people not have a Libertarian option. And so I ask you to waste no more time arguing about what a good Libertarian should be, but to go out there and be one. Be one in your community. Be one in your state party. Be one for your candidates who are running for office. Help each other. Work with each other. I would be honored to be your chair again if you will have me. Thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for all four candidates. Big round of applause. You have been an energetic and raucous and unruly crowd of libertarians, and I love it. I love it. Thank you to the candidates. And that's it. I guess we go drinking now. What are you doing? Drinking dinner. Drinking dinner. Vice Chair debate in 15 minutes. Wow, okay. Whoa. There's some hardcore liberty going on tonight. The Vice Chair debate will start in 15 minutes. So get to the little boys' room and the little girls' room and get back fast. 15 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Just a quick reminder, there's a silent auction. All proceeds go to benefit the Libertarian Party. It's over on that side of the room. You can go look and bid. Please do that during the break. Another reminder for anybody that is going to the gala tomorrow, uh, Mel with Tuxedos to Go will be back about 9 o'clock. If you didn't get your tuxedo yet for that fantastic deal for 169 bucks, altered everything but the shoes and socks, he'll be there tomorrow at 9. They're going to get them altered and back to your readers' reviews at Tuxedos to Go. Get one. Great deal.
other ones has red hair, she'll be there soon. Do you question, do you have questions already? This is the same stack. Some of them are specifically labeled for white stacks. Yes. So choose what you want. Okay. There's lots of them. Oh. Mic check, mic check, mic check, mic check. Check one, two. Check one, two. I sound good. I just did, yes. Yes. Rules of order, guys. So, let's see how it goes. Go. Go, go, go. So, do I. Um, so, these are questions that have been submitted. Uh, some of them are specific. Sure. Some of them um, I will help us identify the ones that are just fucking crazy. Uh, this is chair debate. We can get rid of it. Share question. Uh, share, share, okay. Chair or vice, how can LS invest in both affiliate efforts to establish and maintain valid access to this? This is chair. What are your top three achievements? That's pretty good. Vice Chair Bay, do you feel like being deliberately offensive or controversial from those donations to the party? I'd be, I'm sure we'll, that's going to come up anyways, but let's just keep it there for the moment. Vice Chair. Uh, this is not, I mean, the Vice Chair does have to do some things, yes. Jesus Christ, tell me that. Well, I was, I was, that's why I was. Jesus, turn the mics on. Uh, we're moderating the question. Yes. Am I allowed to yield my time to somebody else? Uh, I heard this came up. What's your plan? And my plan is I was going to ask about if you could pass my time to the police. Pass it? I might take the sense of the room. Okay. I'm not a parliamentarian. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to get a sense of the room. Maybe uh, it might, I mean, the gesture path is really nice functionally. So uh, a, a compromise that might be arriving after the gestures um, is to have him take care of it. Okay. 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 okay, like in the opening or something like that? Something like that, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but ask it live.
exception. So We, we had a version of the offensive And we had the, this one here, yeah. Do you feel that we deliver the offensive um, uh, points, donations, and body of arms that we're going to do? I have a way to I think this one was a little bit different. Yeah. Let's do that because that's a value judgment and this might not be exactly what we're Seventy million votes, but we need to get one million votes if we change the way we're doing it. So that's a great question. Yeah. And it's just great. Let's all vote for Tom Woods. Let's all vote for Tom Woods.
if you are a candidate for the vice chair position for the Libertarian Party. Could you head in the general direction of the stage, please? And if you're qualified to participate by engaging in some tokens. Hey, hi. We're going to get started soon if y'all want to get close to your seats. I can watch you drink beer with lust in my heart. Please find your seats because you've been here since eight in the morning, people. Ladies and gentlemen, the vice chair's debate is about to begin. If you are having a conversation you would like to continue, I would like to invite you to do so about 40 feet that way. Otherwise, I would invite you to sit down and enjoy the next hour and a half or so of debate. Tell your friends. him up, he can choose to be first, second, third, fourth, or fifth. That's the way to put a number next to him. So call up Merced first, ask him what position he wants, and then ask him to take whatever podium you want to be the last. Uh, or not. I mean, it's up to you. Okay. Okay. However you want to do it, I'm cool. This part is the part I don't care about. <laughs> Please find a seat, people.
we are going to go ahead and get started now. So if you wouldn't mind taking your seats. And Matt Welch, did you want to go ahead and invite the candidates up onto the stage? Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Merced, Sam Goldstein, Joe Hoffman, Arvin Voris, Steve Sheets, come on down. As you find your seats, I am going to remind everyone and the candidates of the rules, which sound impossibly complex, but seem to kind of work last time. They're slightly modified because we have five gentlemen up here. Um, so they will each have a two minute opening statement. Uh, they will each uh, hear and respond to five audience questions that we have sorted through. Naomi and I will ask one question each as well, and then each candidate will have one question that they can ask another candidate. Each one has a four minute or has four uh, rebuttal cards of 30 seconds each, which they could use to rebut or to extend and revise their remarks. And each has a two minute close, which cannot be rebutted, but can be extended if you have saved up your cards. Do we all understand it? Exactly. First thing that we need to do is to figure out what order they're going to start here. And by virtue of their token lobster dominance pecking order here, Alex, you get to choose what order would you like? I'll go first. Alex goes first. Sam? I will go last. Okay. Got to get a better pen I'll go here. second to last. Hold on now. Five, four. Arvin? I'll go second. And Steve? Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> it's a test. Okay. You go third. Can you switch podiums? Yeah, so switch Alex. Steve. Okay. Arvin, Steve. Where would it go? It's like, it's like musical podiums. You probably want this. Nice. Arvin. We're going to ask you to do that again later just for our own amusement. All right. Alex Merced, two minutes is yours. Hey everybody, my name is Alex Merced and I'm running to be the next vice chair of the Libertarian National Committee. In the last debate, Nick Sowork said that he was running to be the least important person in the Libertarian Party. He was oh. wrong. Oh, no, I'm oh. running to be the least important part person in the Libertarian Party. And now... What? Uh, audio's dead. Hold on, hold on, hold oh, on. Oh, okay. Hold on. Can we fix that speaker? Really? Hello, hello, check, check. Is that better? It's better. All right. Okay, okay we good? Okay. So should I start over? Hello? Start over. No, it's, it's out again. Oh, I'm out again? We're good, good, good. Check, check, check. One, check, two. No, it can't hear me? Okay, let's keep trying to get this right. Check, check, one, check, two, check, three. Do we got sound? So the audience is saying that they can hear the moderators, but they cannot hear these microphones. Raise your hand if you can hear me. Okay, so this side right here, we're having some, uh, some difficulty hearing. So over the speaker on this side, right over here. Keep your hand up if you can hear me. Keep your hand up if you can hear me. Good, good, good. Okay, so again, down here, we're having trouble with hearing. Let's see, we want to see every hand up so that we can start this debate. Okay, let's see here. Hands up, Just hands up, let's see who way. can hear me. Still no, hear, no sound over here still? Do we get it? Is it? You can hear him? Okay. Um, okay, we're good? We're good now? Okay. Excellent. Start this boy over. Go. Hey, everybody. My name is Hello. My name is Alex Merced, and I'm running to be the next vice chair of the Libertarian National Committee. In the previous Ooh. debate, Nick Sawark said that he was running to be reelected as the least important person in the Libertarian Party. He was wrong. I'm running to be the least important person in the Libertarian Party. Now, thank you. Now, people, a lot of you guys gave me advice on what, how I should be in this debate. And what you all said is that I should just be myself. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tell you guys who I am. I'm just a nice guy. And by the end of tonight, I'm gonna show you that nice guys don't finish last, that they'll finish first. Now, I'm running to be vice chair because I wanna be someone who encourages, empowers, and energizes. At the end of the day, whether we like it or not, the chair and the vice chair do have more visibility than many other positions within the party. We, that visibility can either be an asset or a liability. And as we've seen in the past, at times it's been a liability. Now, if you elect a new vice chair, it will no longer be a liability, but with me, it'll be an asset. Okay? Because I'm gonna be 
aggressively using multi multimedia ways to communicate, to make sure that people know what the LNC is doing. The LNC is doing a lot of great work. The last two years, the last four years, they've done a lot of great things, but a lot of times people aren't aware. They don't have that connection with national. And if people don't have that connection, if they're not aware of what's going on, they don't renew. And if they don't renew their membership, or we don't get new memberships, that means there's less resources to build the infrastructure to do what we all want, get libertarians elected, make libertarian change, have a more libertarian world. So I'm going to be out there to be the cheerleader of the Libertarian Party, to make sure that people know who's doing amazing jobs, because I want people knowing who the candidates are. I want the voice to always be in the candidates. I don't want to be a distraction from candidates. I want to be a megaphone for candidates, so people know who the candidates are, and people in Massachusetts hear from the Massachusetts candidates, because I don't know what a Massachusetts person wants. Massachusetts candidates know what a Massachusetts person wants, and that's what I'm going to be doing. Outreach to get new people in, inreach to keep people in. Okay. Mr. Moderator, I have a question. Yes, sir. Am I allowed to cede some of my time to another person? No. <laughs> get, a, get a sense of the room. First of all, get a sense of your competitors. Thumbs I would like up, to thumbs yield down. some of my time to James Weeks if he is in the room. I'm hearing that is not the will of the delegates, and since I am the captain of this ship right now, apparently, what's wrong with you people? Um, as much as I would like to see James Weeks speak, it doesn't sound like that the delegates want it. Go forth, Arvind Vora. The biggest contribution that the libertarian movement has made over the last decades has been a wholehearted, full-throated rejection of the nanny state. Because we have philosophically rejected the nanny state, because we have boldly gone out there and said to end the drug war, because we wear legalized cocaine buttons in areas that are not ready for that message, we have inspired people to reject the nanny state. And because of that, policy is changing. We have changed hearts and minds. Not pandered to them, changed hearts and minds. And because of that today, we have marijuana being legalized, which was unthinkable when Ron Paul was first talking about that. We have right to try laws that are getting passed. We are rejecting the nanny state. And now I believe it is time for the libertarian movement to take the next step. And that is to completely and thoroughly reject the welfare state. Right now, I saw you guys, I saw, I saw this room booing when Matt Keenel talked about Medicare for all, and I agree. I don't want Medicare for all. I disagree with that position. But when I go from one state to another and hear people that support government schools for all, I have no choice but to see a huge hypocritical divide in our movement. And I will be the vice chair that's going to go everywhere and talk about the ideas that people aren't ready for yet so that I can pave the way and help you pave the way to make them ready for those ideas in the future. I will be talking about abolishing government schools with people who aren't ready to hear it. I will be talking about legalizing automatic weapons in front of crowds that are trying to ban all guns. I have already done that many times. I will be the person who's going in the media saying things that are bold and exciting enough to be retweeted by, by organizations like WikiLeaks, and I've done that too. If you re-elect me vice chair, I will push the boundaries in every way possible. Steve Sheets. I'm standing in front of a room of my future employers. You, the Libertarian Party, are the most important people in our movement. It's our job as the LNC to help support your efforts. As you run your local candidates, as you run your statewide candidates, it's our job to help facilitate ballot access drives. It's our job to help you come across with the tools that you need to get what you want done. And when it comes down to it, who is in charge of the message but the people in our local organizations? Because nobody knows what our local organizations know and what they need more than our local candidates do, what our local people do. Right now, I'm seeing a whole room filled with libertarians from all across the nation, 50 states, right? You guys all came here because you want a better party. You want to be part of a better party. 
and I'm here to help you do that. Thank you. Joe Hauptman. My name is Joe Hauptman. I first got involved in the libertarian movement back in the 70s. He talks about legalizing drugs. The party was around before the drug war. When I went to college at Michigan State, marijuana was a parking ticket. Okay, you basically wrote a ticket and you pay, mailed in your fine. Okay, yes, we've made progress, but it's not just because of our radical position. For 40 years, we've been saying it's all or nothing, and we've gotten exactly what we've demanded, nothing. I, my first campaign was with Ed Clark in 1979. When I called the national headquarters and said, who's running the petition drive in Indiana? And they said, funny, you should ask. <laughs> and then I said, I need help from the state party. Who's in charge? And they said, funny, you should ask. And I got to pick up the treasury, and as a young lawyer, got to basically quelch the bench warrants for our treasurer, who didn't believe in filing government forms as a matter of principle. I've been through all of those stages. I was in the party when the people showed up at my house and said, this is the first time I've been in a room full of libertarians where I wasn't alone. I was there when we grew. I was there when we had 32,000 members in this party, when we had a budget of $3.8 million. I was there when we went down. I've been state chair three times. I bring institutional memory. What will we do with it? That is up to the chair. The chair decides my use. I want to bring this knowledge and make that available to whoever is the next chair. And Sam Goldstein, opening statement, please. Hi, Libertarians. How y'all doing tonight? I want to welcome you to the convention. I'm on the convention oversight committee. We've been working on this thing for 18 months now, and I think that uh, our gang has done a great job putting this together. You guys are going to have a good time if you haven't already, and we're going to elect new officers tomorrow for the party for the next two years, leading up to the Austin meeting in um, Labor Day, uh, Memorial Day weekend, 2020. I've been doing this for almost 20 years, not quite as long as my esteemed colleague from Indiana, uh, but I've had a concentrated amount of experience, and let me tell you why I'm doing it. Um, I have two grandchildren. One is two and one is four. And my four-year-old grandchild apparently listens to me because when we walk through the neighborhood and he looks down in a sewer grate and he says, Grandpa, I scared Publicans, Democrats down there. <laughs> he's, he's been listening because he knows who the threat is to us. You guys need to get along better and we need to get along better. We are not the enemy. The enemy is those people out there that dip into your paychecks, dip into your houses, dip into your gun lockers, or attempt to. Those people are the enemy of the Libertarian Party and of freedom everywhere. And the way we do that in the Libertarian Party, because we're a political party, is to get people elected. I'll explain a little bit more about my experience a little bit later, but I was state chair of Indiana for two terms when we ran hundreds of candidates for public office. I have also run for public office myself eight times in Indiana. I've managed campaigns at all levels, and I've served on the LNC now for four terms. I've got a lot of experience, probably the most at the national level in any of the candidates up here, and if I get elected vice chair, I will serve to the best of my ability to whatever the chair asks me, and also projects that I'll explain a little bit more later that we've been working on for the past four years. Thank you. We now move on to our audience questions. The first question, uh, and we will begin with Arvind Vora. Do you feel that being deliberately offensive or controversial promotes donations to the party or harms it? That's a good question. And I do believe that if you are being deliberately controversial in the right mindset, you can create a huge amount of reach. You can start to actually change, not just pander to hearts and minds, and you can actually put forth the ideas of the libertarian movement. 
I've been to so many state parties who chose the pandering route, who, who because of that, in their own parties, in their own conventions, the people who oppose the existence of government schools are the minority. And that's a basic minarchist position. That's not an ANCAP thing. If you want to ask about a general political position, of course, look at the current sitting president. He couldn't be more offensive if he tried. And yet he is the current sitting president. I don't agree with him, but the idea that offensiveness doesn't exist in politics is wrong. In politics, if you are not being opposed, you are being ignored. And as we get bigger, we should be opposed more. Steve Sheets. I said this before earlier today, just because we've done something for a long, long time doesn't mean we need to keep doing it. Right now, when you find an offensive message and you're pushing that to the population, you are alienating a certain number of people, people who are new to the party, people who haven't really digested libertarianism altogether, yet when they see this offensive message, they're saying, why am I going to be part of this group? They're really completely unprofessional. I don't want to have completely unprofessional messaging. I want to help our candidates develop a clear, concise, consistent professional message. We can be edgy, but we don't have to be obnoxious. Joe Hauptman. I honestly get a feeling sometimes when I hear talks about edgy approaches, I feel like saying, been there, done that, already gave the shirt to Goodwill. Um, <laughs> this is nothing new. Uh, back in the 70s, there was an article written called The Great Libertarian Macho Flash. And since C-SPAN isn't here, I'm not going to edit it. It says you're at a cocktail party, and the little old lady comes up to you and says, what's a libertarian? What's, what do you believe? And you look at her and you say, fuck the state. And you're right. You're right. You've said it concisely. You've said it simply. You feel morally superior. And you have guaranteed there's at least one person who will never cast a vote for a libertarian. <laughs> Folks, in this country, the only way we get power is with the vote. And there aren't enough of us. Here, here. Sam Goldstein. Could you please repeat, uh, repeat the question? There's like a weird echo down here. Uh, do you feel that being deliberately offensive or controversial promotes donations to the party or harms it? Well, I could tell you an example of being on the uh, convention committee this year. We lost at least one $5,000 contribution because of controversies going on. And I don't think that's a good thing. Being obnoxious and being controversial are two different things. I ran, for, I ran for superintendent of public instruction in Indiana, I believe, in the year 2000. And I took some pretty controversial positions. I was on a statewide hookup on radio hookup on NPR, and I stated very specifically that if they voted me into office, I would go to the Department of Education, fire everybody, and come back in the schools who would be better shaped four years later. Of course, the Indiana Constitution requires government schools. I'm opposed to government schools, but you have to do a gradual approach to dealing with situations that may be controversial because we're not going to get anything done unless we get people elected. Alex Merced. I'm a libertarian because I want to save lives. We're losing lives every day in the drug war, in the wars abroad, and every time we lose people because it's good to push people to push on their ideas, so that way they can bend closer to liberty. But you don't want to push so hard that they break and they walk away. And the more that they walk away, that's the less closer we are to ending the drug war, the wars abroad, and lives are being lost. I'm in this, not to win some beauty race, I'm in this to save lives, because this is what matters. And that's why it's important for us to work together, to grow together. That's why everything I've been saying these last six months is for us to be libertarian together, to grow that unity, so that way we can save lives. Next audience question, uh, starting with Steve Sheets. Uh, what is current leadership doing well? And what would you try to continue that current leadership is doing? 
The ballot access drives that the LNC has been doing has been actually spectacular. The fundraising headed up by Lauren Doherty has been absolutely spectacular. <laughs> Seriously. I was gratified at the LNC meeting yesterday when we were in executive session going over Lauren Doherty's contract and we actually agreed that yes, this is a good thing, let's make her a permanent source of income for the Libertarian Party. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. I'd suggest that the best thing that the LNC can do, the best thing that the Libertarian Party can do is help candidates, help candidates achieve ballot access. And one of the, one of the projects I want to do is help develop that clear, concise, consistent professional message through a mentorship program with experienced candidates and novice candidates coming together. Thank you. Joe Hoffman. I would say what the uh, party has done is actually built the big tent. When we have a party where Adam and Bill can both come here and try to build a base, then that is success. We, if you can't deal with opposition where people, with uh, opposition with people that agree with you half the time, or 60, 70 percent of the time, how in the world do you expect you're going to beat the opposition out there? Okay? The five of us up here, we are opponents. We're going to leave here and tomorrow four of us are going to be disappointed. But we're opponents. We're not enemies. The enemy is out there. Okay. Sam Goldstein. Libertarian Party, student, Liber Libertarian Party leadership over the past four years has really stabilized and has significantly increased the ability to service our clients who are the states and the candidates that we are trying to promote. Uh, we now have candidate support specialists. Uh, we now have a candidate support committee that has the ability to financially uh, provide help to certain candidates, candidates that meet the criteria that the LNC finally set for doing so. We have developed, a, as people, other people have mentioned, a development department that we've never had a professional development department before. And more importantly, what we've done in leadership over the past couple of years is develop a camaraderie on the LNC and a esprit de corps that we are all working together in the same direction, although we do have our disagreements. I have not seen a shouting match at this LNC. I have not seen divisiveness. And I've seen people working together in a cooperative manner for the better of all of us. Alex? Who? Alex. Oh, Alex, OK. Hey, everybody. But um, bottom line, the LNC has done some great work over the years. Everything is better, and it can get better. OK, so the fundraising numbers are good. We've hired staff, press secretary, fundraising staff. Those are all great things that the LNC has done. Um, the problem isn't whether they've done things or not. They've done a lot of great things. The problem is not everyone always is aware of them. And sometimes being aware helps you build that connection and builds, you, builds that that connection to make you feel like you're excited to invest your $25, that you're excited to pledge every month. And many people do get re read the letters in the mail, read the emails, and they know, but a lot of people also don't. That's why us on the LNC, and this is what I want to do as vice chair, is be very proactive about going out there and making sure people know about the great work the LNC is doing. By not waiting for people to come, get, come to me, but going to them through live streams and using all levels of multimedia to reach out, to keep you guys aware and keep you guys connected. Again, as we grow, I want us to feel smaller as a community, okay? That way we're close-knit, but we're growing. But um, there's a lot of great things coming in the way, we, in the blockchain committee and other things, and uh, that's my time. Reminder to all the candidates that you do have those four uh, cards on your table that you can use to extend your time or rebut uh, other candidates' uh, statements. Arvin. I think it's good for us to advertise our successes, but our electoral successes are not our strong point if you compare us to the, to the Democratic and Republican parties. They have more of those. What we have that they don't have is better ideas. And what I believe we need to do is clearly accurately, boldly communicate those ideas. 
I don't care if libertarian candidates don't want to end government schools. I do care if they don't know that that's a libertarian position. I don't care if libertarian candidates don't want to legalize automatic weapons, but I do care if they don't know that that's a libertarian position. And when the public at large, because we are hiding the best parts of ourselves, because we are hiding the boldest parts of our platform, does not know what we stand for, that is something that needs to change. We've started to change it, and I want to see it change more. On to our next question. Given that in the absence of the chairman, you will be called upon. <laughs> Excuse me. Given that in the absence of the chairman, you will be called upon to MC the conventions, please explain your experience chairing meetings and or other organizations. And we will begin with Joe. Okay, I have been the chairman of Indiana three times, once in 1979, once in 1998, and again in 2015. I've chaired the convention uh, all those times. Last uh, convention in Indiana, we had over 140 delegates. Um, we, I have experience chairing conventions. I also spent 23 years as a classroom teacher, so I know how to handle chaos. <laughs> that it? That's it. Chaos is a good answer, Joe. Uh, uh, Joe and I have much of the same common experience. I was chair of Indiana for two terms, uh, most recently back, I think, uh, four or five years ago. Uh, at our state conventions, as with when Joe was state chair, we would average between 120 and 150 people at our conventions. Most of them were done in a very cooperative manner. Uh, the Indiana Party has a lot of heart and soul and usually behaves themselves during a convention, so not quite as contentious sometimes as a national convention. Um, going back even further than that, I was the president of my company in junior achievement, so I was a capitalist way back then. and. Uh, and I learned how to run a board meeting very early at that time. Alex. Okay, so I'm certainly the person who probably is the least experienced with rubber rules. So let's just get that straight up. But here's the thing, when I have a weakness, I work twice as hard to make it my strength. Over the last six months, I've been traveling to many of your state conventions and I've sat through, I got there early and I stayed late to your business because I wanted to, one, absorb the culture of your chair, I mean of your uh, part state because I want to represent you, so I need to know you, I need to know where you're at, I need to know what your problems are. Also, with, right before we started, we had some sound problems. What did I do? I took charge. Made sure that we got that sound fixed by having all raised hands. I take charge of situations. I'm a nice guy, but I'm also the right guy. Avin. As the one person who's actually done this job before, let me tell you this. The hard part is not chairing meetings. The hard part is when you have a five minutes warning to go on international media. The hard part is when somebody important has stepped aside so you get to fill in something that is a higher level than what you've expected. The hard part is when you're looking at a room, 100% of which you're sure opposes libertarian views, but you're hoping that someone in that room is going to respond to your true, honest, and accurate messaging. That's the hard part. Can I run a meeting? Sure. But if you guys are basing the, your vice chair election on who can run the meeting the best, you're making your decision based on the worst possible criteria. The most important thing that the vice chair does is major media outreach. It is hard, it is challenging, and it demands a certain skill set and a lot of dedication. And that is... And it demands that you are willing to talk to anyone, anywhere, to convert anyone to real libertarianism. We know that the message of liberty is needed where it's most missing. And Steve. Was the chairman of the Libertarian Party of Pennsylvania for two years? Yes, I've run the meetings. And yes, they went fine. Um, I'm going to agree with Arvin. That's not really the major skill set of the vice chair. The major skill set of the vice chair is filling in when you absolutely have to with very little to no notice. Now, I work in innovation, 
and there are a lot of times when I have to give a presentation and a sales pitch for a new color that I designed to a marketing group out of Indonesia. You know, and this is something that I'm passionate about. It's something that I love. You know, libertarians. This is the most fun I have every two years because I'm in a room filled with libertarians, right? You know, this is cool. But, you know, doing the job is doing the job. And yes, I can do the job and I will do the job for you. Thank you. Next question starts with Sam Goldstein. What are your top three achievements for the Liberty Movement? My top three achievements for the Liberty Movement have probably all been political. Um, while serving as the state chair in Indiana and as county chair in Indianapolis, uh, under my leadership, we've run hundreds of candidates for public office to give the voters in Indiana a true choice on the ballot other than the two old parties. Nothing is more important than running people for office and getting people elected. We could have a debate society and talk online about freedom and, and how wonderful it is, but until we get people elected and start pushing our society in a libertarian uh, a direction, then talk is cheap, but actions speak very loud, and getting people elected and getting candidates on the ballot is the most important thing that I could possibly do, and I've done that way more than three times. Alex Reset. Okay, so a couple, couple quick ones. It's like I'm very proud of my media outreach, and I'm very proud that I've been a, an instructor in the financial industry where I've gotten to teach people libertarian ideas as I teach them financial training. But the thing I'm proudest is my U.S. Senate campaign in 2016. So while I didn't get that many votes, the thing is that we did something tremendous. I did something different. I tried to run a traditional campaign. I was on the phone for hours a day calling potential donors. I, we traveled the state. And this was, the thing is that up to this point, a lot of the chapters in New York State really didn't know each other yet. We weren't connected. That campaign connected them. We became a closer community. We became a closer New York Libertarian Party, and that's paid great dividends for Larry Sharp in 2018. If we can remember to keep our uh, inside voices on Arvin. <laughs> you can look at my list of accomplishments in the Liberty Movement. It's on my handouts. As a few highlights, I helped grow the Libertarian Party social media teams from a Facebook page of about 20,000 to one of over 700,000. But the biggest outreach that I do as vice chair are these two, three minute interviews that reach a national or international audience with a bold message of liberty. Where anytime there's a commentary on what do I think about Trump's latest thing, I'm able to quickly answer that and also put forth a bold libertarian idea to go with it. That is a nugget of information that's getting out there to literally millions of people. That's the job of the vice chair, is to get real libertarian, libertarian ideas out there. Mr. Goldstein suggested that the most important thing we can do is to get people who are nominally libertarians elected. I disagree. The number one thing we need to do is do everything we can to downsize the scope, the size, and the power of government. We got a card. I would like to know, Mr. Vora, how you plan to doing that in a Republican representative republic without getting people elected. The single biggest success in the libertarian movement right now has been the homeschool movement. That is $220 billion a year taken out of the public school system. Right next to it, that's $50 billion a year from the private school movement. Again, taken away from the public school system. And the reason that that happens is because the ideas of liberty have, ta have caught on, because people have chosen to leave. Ideas matter, because sometimes you can make huge changes without even touching policy. Joe Hauptman has a card. I'm a supporter of the homeschool movement, even though I have been a public school teacher for 23 years. I have had students homeschooled. I have, we have many homeschoolers in Indiana. Perhaps your state's different from ours. Don't take credit for things we had nothing to do with. 
A lot of those people are homeschooling to keep their children out of the reach of people like us, okay, who believe in freedom and who believe in free thought. It is now the turn of Steve Sheets. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't see the card. I have traveled the country over the last year. I've spoken to libertarian groups. I have spoken to homeschooling groups. I've spoken to Republican groups. I've spoken to Democrat groups. I've spoken to anarcho-communists and anarcho-capitalists. And I'll tell you one thing. If you want to see where libertarian ideas are really catching on, where a full-throated, full-scale rejection of the state is catching on, where people are ready to abolish the income tax and property tax, where people are really ready to abolish government schools, it is happening in the homeschool movement. Those are our natural allies. That's who we need to talk to. We need to quit pandering to government school teachers and reach to our real allies. Has the card activity ceased? Steve. The best that I have are all shared achievements. Getting an, elected, getting an elected libertarian elected is one of those achievements. Um, and incorporated with that was winning a ballot challenge. Incorporated with that was making sure that not a single Republican won election or re-election in that particular race, which I thought was pretty awesome. Um, another thing that we do in, in my group is we went out and we protested against um, land grabs. And we did so well that we stopped them. But it wasn't just me, it was, yes, I organized it. But there was 70 libertarians that wandered around and we protested and we worked and we pushed and we stopped it. You know, another one that we did was I got together a group of Greens, Republicans, Democrats, Socialists, Communists, the whole gamut, man, and we all protested at a drone base. We protested a drone base because it was horrible. But that wasn't just my achievement. That was the achievement of everybody who showed up that day. Everybody that showed up that day and decided to send their message about how horrible that drone base was, how horrible that bombing was. And you know what? Despite the fact that that drone base is still there, that wasn't the victory. The victory was we all came together, we all, something that, we all saw something that was horrible, and we all decided to do something about it. And I was very proud to be part of that. Thank you. Joe Huffman. I ran the petition drive in Indiana that got Ed Clark on the ballot. I ran the petition drive that got us ballot access in Indiana. I ran the campaign that got us ballot access in Indiana. I ran for Congress twice. I still hold the record in the U.S. for a three-way race against a Republican and a Democrat for House of Representatives with 11.4 percent. I've held that, I have held that record from 1998, and I am disgusted that I still hold that record. That should not be the case. And the other major thing I've done is in 23 years of teaching, over 3,000 students have passed through my classroom. And you know when you're a physics teacher, nobody bothers to check what you're doing in your classroom. <laughs> and I have probably created hundreds of libertarians. Because somebody is going to teach those kids you can't put them into a cold freeze until we take power. And would you rather have someone who believes what we do teaching them or have someone who believes that other shit? We now move on to our final audience question. What makes a good, effective affiliate, in your opinion? We'll start with Alex Merced. What makes a good effect affiliate is the relationships that the, not only the state, well, the, the whole state has together. Like, I've been to many of your state conventions over the last six months, and I've gotten to build a lot of amazing relationships with a lot of the members across the country and see a lot of amazing teams. And what I see is the biggest thing that drives is that everyone gets to know each other, that everyone likes each other. It's those relationships that get people to stay. That's why I stayed. In 2013, after running for New York City Public Advocate, I stayed because I fell in love with the people I was working with. And it's those relationships that help us organize and grow because we want to work with the people that we're with. So it's building those relationships. It's having a team that wants to build those relationships. And that's, kind of, that's the kind of mentality I want to take to national, that I want to build a relationship with all of you. I want to get to know all of you. I want to have a door that's open to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Avin Faro. There are phases. There are phases. The very first phase that any group needs to have is a sense of what the goals are. And those goals, in my opinion, abolishing government schools, ending the war on drugs, shutting down the military welfare complex, bringing the troops home, ceasing to deal with other nations with threats and violence. Those are the primary goals. The next phase is having an action plan to start to achieve those goals. But if that first phase isn't met, if you have an action plan to achieve the wrong goals, then that's not success. That's actually scoring a goal for the other team. What I want to see happen is to make sure the whole movement, the whole party, at least understands what the goals officially are. You have the right to disagree with them. But you don't have the right to misdefine libertarianism publicly and trick people into believing that libertarianism has plays for things that it simply does not. One of those things is government schools. One of those things is military overreach. Participating in and enabling those is not a libertarian thing to do. And I do want to see that ideology out there. Steve Sheets. Goals. You know, um, we have a lot of people here who are trying to run for office. You know, we have a lot of novice candidates who are running for office, and every time you see a novice candidate running for office, a lot of times they wind up reinventing the wheel. What I'd really love to do, and this isn't really a top-down thing, this is something that we do on the side, bottom up. We get together some experienced candidates, we put them together with novice candidates, and together we basically hone and, and gather together all that imperial knowledge that we have. We have a lot of knowledge about how to handle ballot access challenges. And the problem is the novice candidates aren't getting it. My goal is to make sure that novice candidates get that, they get the ability to meet up with experienced candidates to help hone their messages. We all have different ideas about how best to present our message, right? But at the same time, no matter what, we can get somebody to help us hone our message so we can have a clear, concise, consistent, professional message. That's my goal. Joe Hauptman. Actually, I agree with both of them. Goals is the key. I think, however, in terms of who sets the goals, it shouldn't be national. If Arvin can get his state to sit, go with those goals, more power to him. Indiana has set different goals. We are a state that you would probably call pragmatic. But as a result of us, we for now, for the first time in 80 years, can buy liquor on Sunday. And that is due, that is due to the Indiana party. Because of our candidate for governor, Rupert, from Survivor, in Indiana, now you can actually get your felonies expunged. That wasn't available, and nobody talked about it until Rupert brought it up in the debates. We can have effect. We set goals that we can achieve, and we move the ball down the field. Sam Goldstein. Could you please repeat the question? I'm kind of way down here. What makes a good, effective affiliate, in your opinion? I think I'll answer the question, unlike my opponents. I think an effective affiliate is one that functions on its own entirely with no help whatsoever from the national party. Unfortunately, the ugly truth is those are fairly few and uh, far between right now. A lot of affiliates need help with leadership training, which we could provide certainly on their request. A lot of affiliates need help with financial goals, such as ballot access races and ballot access petitioning drives. We give that money to a lot of affiliates, and my goal there is to have those affiliates become self-sufficient within the next four years. It's no surprise we're going to have elections every two years for the foreseeable future in this country. And if we could get those affiliates to begin planning their ballot access drives now, for 2020, then they're going to have a lot better chance of not having to come to the LNC for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I do have to commend and compliment a couple places that we've helped recently. The state of Oklahoma. The LNC struggled and struggled and spent 
well over $100,000, maybe close to $150,000 on helping Oklahoma with ballot access a few years ago. That state has made tremendous strides in organization, is having contested primaries for their offices, and is running a bunch of candidates for the first time in a long time, and I really compliment them, and I will expand on more states later on. Thank you. Has Alex answered this question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so then this next moderator question starts with Alex, mm -hmm. as my brain is uh, capturing this. Start, this starts with Arvin? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. It's complicated. To, uh, abacus is over here. This is a moderator question. Uh, Tom Woods said at an event down the street uh, yesterday that the LP could shoot for 70 million votes, but probably won't get there. So it would be better off getting 1 million voters if those 1 million voters have their lives changed in the process. Do you agree with that? Who's, am I starting? Yeah. yeah oh, OK. Um, I've often talked about converting people to homeschooling with many of you. And people ask, if you convert one kid to homeschooling, does that really make a difference? And my answer is, it makes a huge difference to that one kid. If we can start to convert people to the real ideas of libertarianism, it makes a huge difference to that one million people. But I'm going to have to reject the premise that Tom Woods put forward. If you actually add up the people who would vote libertarian, who have rejected the state, who have nothing to gain from the state, if you add up all the people who don't use government schools or who don't have children in the first place, if you add up all the people who are not part of the military welfare complex, if you add up all the people who are not part of the government, who see the government as a net loss, we can get 70 million people and explain our actual position and have them buy into what we actually believe. Steve Sheets. Well, I'm also going to say that I don't really like the premise. The idea of 70, voter, or 70 million voters is really awesome. But I want 70 million voters who understand why it is they're voting for libertarianism, right? I think everybody can agree with that. The whole point in getting 70 million voters to understand what it is that they're voting for is basically the winning goal, man. When we have someone winning for president of the United States, it's not going to be because that person had a really great message. It's because we already won the war. And if we win that war and we control our messaging, clear, concise, consistent, professional messaging, right? We will win the hearts. We will free the minds of all the people across the United States. That's what I'm looking for. Joe Hauptman. The Economist just wrote an article about the future of democracy. And in it, it quoted a poll that says, of Americans under the age of 30, a third do not consider it important to live in a democracy. That scares the shit out of me. We don't have the time to win all of the hearts and minds to perfect libertarianism. We are a party. I'm a science teacher, and that's not a physicist, but I'm a science teacher. We are a party of theoretical physicists. Our best politicians are hydraulic engineers. The people are screaming for plumbers. They've got problems, and they want the problems fixed, and we won't even talk to them until they show that they have an understanding of fluid dynamics. Arvin plays a card. I don't think you need to have a PhD in philosophy to understand that we are about abolishing government schools. I don't think you need a PhD in philosophy to understand legalized cocaine. I don't think you need a PhD in philosophy to understand legalize all automatic weapons. I don't think that libertarianism really demands such a huge and massive intellectual exercise. What we need to do is say what we stand for. 
And you know what? A lot of people are already there. Not everyone. And some people are going to get there, but we have to let them know where that there is. Right now, we are hiding our message so well that our communicators are believing the lie. We have people who came in believing that there is room for government schools in the Libertarian Party. And now when they go and can try to convert people, they're spreading that message not because they're trying to trick anybody, because we tricked them first and they weren't in on the secret. So I completely reject the idea that we need to have a pe that we need to have people do something so difficult to understand libertarianism. Steve Sheets plays a card. Freedom. Being in control of your own life. These are not complex ideas. I agree with Arvin. Um, I don't believe it takes rocket science to portray libertarianism to people, and I don't believe that we demand that people understand rocket science, to understand that being in control of their own lives, their own finances, their own children's education is important. All of this stuff is important, and it's simple. It's very easy for people to grasp, and we need to talk to them in their language. And Joe Hauptman plays a card. It's simple to us. <laughs> it's simple to us. We have been in our own echo chamber for 40 years. We have people out there who, when you say taxation is theft, their eyes glaze over. Okay, trust me, as a teacher, I know that look. Okay, what happens is you have you cannot take a person who has spent yeah. their entire life. You cannot oh. take a person. Extends. Go. You cannot take a person who has spent their entire life chained to a hospital bed and say, yes, you can run a marathon. Let's go. Yes. That, yes. Folks, we've said that for 40 years. 40 years. It doesn't work. Alex Merced has a card on the floor. It shouldn't have to be a choice. Yes, one extreme of, again, pushing too hard, you might break. But if you don't push at all, you don't get change either. It shouldn't, we shouldn't be looking and saying, well, that doesn't work, but it also shouldn't be, it's a balance. We want to have votes. Votes should count and should be a signal of a principled and well-communicating candidate of the lives they've changed and the, and the policy that will change because of that change. It's not a choice, between, it's not a choice. You can have both. We just need to work together to build the infrastructure and find the candidates to do that. I confess in all honesty that I forget where we are. Is it Joe or is it Sam? All right, very good. Uh, Sam, very... if you can answer the question, if you could possibly remember it. Uh, yeah, could you do me the courtesy of repeating it? Because uh, there's been a little Boil bit of give and take. Boil it down to uh, <laughs> the choice between reaching a mythical 70 million voters or reaching just 1 million, but you changed every one of those 1 million voters' minds. I'll tell you, I'll take the 70 million in a second. Because here's what happens if we get 70 million votes in an election cycle. The news media is going to pay attention to us. They don't give a damn about us now. They ignore us. They never even run our candidate totals on the little trailer on election night. If we get 70 million votes, they're going to wake up. They were kind of shocked when Trump won the election, but they're going to be more shocked when we get 70 million votes in any given election cycle, be it for president or governor or all of our candidates combined across the country, because that's something that's never happened in this country. Not even the socialist parties in the early parts of the uh, 20th century got 70 million votes. So um, I dispute what Mr. Wood said. I'll take the 70 million votes in a second. And I'm not going to argue philosophy for the next half an hour. I don't think it matters. We need to get people elected. We need to give them a concise message of freedom, but we need to get them elected to change society in a libertarian direction. Thank you. Alex. Okay, I kind of answered the question when I threw that card earlier. I don't think it has to be a choice. I think we can work together. And that's what I want to be. I want to be able to focus on bringing everyone together, building bridges. I want to be a mediator. I want to be a facilitator. I want to be an encourager. When I say I want to be the Libertarian Party's cheerleader, I really mean it because that means we can work together and we can make these changes and we won't have to choose between votes and changing lives. Now, bottom line is I want to have an open door policy. I want to be accessible. I want to be reachable. And many of you who I've talked to, I know sometimes you get frustrated because things are hard and things are difficult and sometimes you don't feel that 
the, re the basically the help that you want is there, or, or you're just not aware of it if it is there. I'm going to be here for you to vent to. I'm here to tell you it's okay. I'm here to keep you on the ship because this we are evolving. We are at a turning point, and I want to keep you guys on the ship a little longer as we as we hit the next plateau as we cross the other side of this threshold. Uh oh. Thank you. Oh, that's just it. got intimate. Cool. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that was kind of cool. Okay. It's like a party atmosphere for a second. All right, next question. So, of course, my question is going to be about blockchain. Uh, there has been a lot of talk at this convention that the party that most embraces blockchain and cryptocurrency is going to have a huge advantage at uh, bringing more people over to the Libertarian Party. Do you agree with this? And if so, what will you do to promote the Libertarian Party as the most crypto-friendly of all the parties? And we're going to start with Steve Sheets. Uh, can can you repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> can I repeat the question? Okay, it's to do with cryptocurrency and blockchain. Uh, people saying that being the most crypto-friendly party will do a lot to bring more people over to our site. So what can we do in the Libertarian Party and what specifically will you do to promote the Libertarian Party as the most crypto-friendly party? Back in April, during the LNC meeting, a motion was put forward to create a crypto group so they could flash out how best we could do these things. Um, earlier a report came out from that particular group and they decided that we're going to work on making a crypto committee and we're going to be deciding that on the LNC. When is that going to be? Tuesday? Um, yeah, it'll be the first uh, new LNC meeting, yes. Yeah. So that's basically what we're doing, man. We are trying to open things up so that crypto is actually something we're talking about, something that we're interested in. There's a lot of people who don't know what crypto is, what crypto means, and this is something that we need to be at the forefront of. We need to figure out what it is that we're talking about, and we need to be telling people what it is that we're talking about. Crypto seems to be awesome to me, and I think we can do it. Joe Hubman. I'll leave it to the people who know something about it. Um, I've been in the party since we had their uh, spiritual uh, forefathers, the gold bugs. Um, we've been through these things before, and if it's as wonderful as everyone says, that's great. And I'll leave it to the people who understand it to come up with a plan, and we'll see what it says. But I'll be honest, I don't know anything about it. Sam Goldstein. I think we have the old geezer caucus down at this end of the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I will have to tell you that the Libertarian Party does take cryptocurrency for contributions. If the people with millions of Bitcoin or whatever want to give it to us, we, we found a way to take it and we'd be more than happy to do so. Um, when the original crypto, or pardon me, the blockchain committee, was, uh, the proposal was made at the meeting in Denver, um, I was primarily opposed to it because it didn't make any sense. The people that proposed the uh, motion may very well have known a lot about cryptocurrency and about blockchain and technology, but they didn't know how to put together a proposal that would tell us what they wanted to do, how it was going to affect the party, and how it would benefit the party. So I would be dependent on that group and the report that they just turned in that was written in a technical language that I was just, I've was i got a degree in education. I couldn't understand what they were trying to tell me. They have to be able to put it in more presentable information. Alex Massad. Well, I would be a very tech forward vice chair. I love technology. I think technology will free us. And that's why I want to keep government away from technology, so that way technology can develop, the free market can develop, and provide those tools for people to empower themselves. And blockchain is one of them, 3D printing is one of them, the sharing economy is another. And I want to protect all of them from regulation, taxation, and all those things. Now, I'm on the blockchain committee, and it's one, of the thing, one of the projects that we proposed was creating a compliance guide for candidates, because a lot of candidates would like to accept crypto donations. It's an easy way, one, to fundraise, but two, also to build connections with the blockchain community, which could be possible funders. So if we can renew the blockchain committee, um, we will produce a compliance guide that can help people in any state find out how they can accept crypto. And that small difference can be an outreach tool and a fundraising tool, and again, can show us that we're the tech party of technology and get all those techno entrepreneurs of all aspects of technology on our side. Thank you. 
Avin Vara. I made the original motion to have that committee created. I 100% support it. Blockchain, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Dash, Monero, those are all homeschooling for currency. Those are opting out of the state-mandated currency to create something better. And I 100% support it. It is our way to opt out of the state-run currency. If you look at the successes of our movement, we have individual choice. That's people opting out of things like government schools. We have policy that's legalizing marijuana in Colorado. And we have techno-libertarians. Technology is a major, major part of what's going to set us free. Alex is right about that. Now, the key thing is we need to recognize this. We have one of the most important things for a successful, for, to help cryptocurrency grow, and that's network. Network effect is one of the most important things, and we need to absolutely tap into that. I 100% support that, and I absolutely think we should do everything we can to encourage the use of, of, of Bitcoin and crypto. Okay, now, what I want to do is make a point that I'm a man of action. And the bottom line is I want you to understand crypto. I want you to understand technology. And I created educational videos for you to understand, because I want everyone in this room to understand, because this is going to, be, this is going to help all of us out as we go out there and we reach out. At BitcoinBlockchainCrypto.com, there's videos where I, where I communicate what these ideas are in a clear way that people can understand. So please go check those out so that we can understand. And also see a proof of concept, the kind of resources I want to provide the Libertarian Party. Whether, whether I'm vice chair or not, I'm providing those resources. You can already find a lot of them over there, resources.libertarian101.com. My fight for liberty never stops. We have now moved to the questions candidates ask one another. You have one question. Choose wisely. Joe Halpern, you start. Hmm. Alex. What will you do to assist the smaller states that have not yet, shall we say, reached critical mass? Bottom, bottom line is be accessible. I want to be reachable. It doesn't matter how big your delegation is. It doesn't matter how many elected representatives you have. My door is open to you. And I want to find out what you need. Because I don't, know, I don't magically know what you need. But, I want, but, if you, but I'm here to listen. And listening is half the battle. Okay, so I will be an opening ear to hear what your challenges are, and I'm going to do my best to figure out what the solutions are. And, if, and then when it comes to morale, I'll be more than glad to come visit, work with you guys, and show that you're not alone in this. I'm here for you. Sam Goldstein, question for somebody. This is a tough one. Um, I think I would like to ask Mr. Vora what he possibly hoped to accomplish in the past year and a half with this constant stream of abusive, obnoxious, and insulting posts and series of articles about many valued people of our community. I spent three years as vice chair towing the line, which is bold ideas and placid and polite messaging. When I went around the country, I saw that it had failed. I saw that in our own party, our own elected representatives, our own candidates couldn't get behind the most basic minarchist principles. I'm not talking about the crazy ANCAP stuff. The, our own basic minarchist principles. I saw military recruiting happening at the level of the LNC. I saw people in the LNC joining the military, full well knowing about how bad our foreign policy is. They chose to enable it under advisement from other people in the LNC. I realized that what I had been doing for three years had failed. I know how to be polite on Facebook. Go back a year and everything before that is polite. I realized that it did not work. So I changed based on what I had seen around the country, based on the conversations that I had with elected representatives and candidates, and I realized that I had to change that. Alex Merced, you have a question. Hmm. Steve, yes, sir. how was your day today? <laughs> I had a chance to spend the day with a thousand of my closest friends. Okay? Um, seriously, nothing is better than that. Uh, 
we're libertarians and we come from a variety of different backgrounds. This was on full display during the platform committee meetings that I was part of. Uh, we had 20 people in that room and we had some unbelievable philosophical differences. I mean, we butted heads and it was just hilarious to look at if you could look at it without your eyes bleeding. Um, <laughs> anyway, long story short, one of the funniest one of the funniest things that came to me, actually one of the really great things that came to me, was a proposal that I put forward. Um, and I changed just a couple words. I changed something that went from people should be free to people are inherently free. And everybody just fell in love with that language in that room that day. And it was Brother Star. It was Sister Alicia. It was Sister Harlos. And it was Brother Sheets, and it was Brother Seebeck. Minister Seebeck, where is he? Anyway. Um, the point is, at that moment, the realization washed over me that this wasn't language put forth by Steve Sheets. This is now language put forth by the Libertarian Party. This is us together, man. We are working to make something happen together. Let's come together and make something happen. Thank you. Arvind Vora, you have a question. My question is for Steve. Yes, sir. Steve, if at this moment in time, if you could wave a magic wand and abolish all government schools in America, would you do so? If I could wave a magic wand and have some way to have all of our children being educated and everything working just wonderfully, absolutely, man. And one of the things that I really want to see happen, I want to see the Department of Education go away. Mm -hmm. I want to put control back in the hands of the parents. I want us to have control of the children's education back in control where it belongs, man, because children all learn differently. When you put your children's education in the hands of a bureaucracy that's in Washington, D.C., it's going to fail. It's demonstrated that it's going to fail. It's been failing for the better part of a century, and it's got to go. And finally, Steve, you have a question. I have a question. Wow. You know, all these guys on this stage, I've been to several debates with, and we've gone around to various conventions with. Joe Houtman, which convention was your favorite? Oh. Whoa, that's a tough uh, question, Joe. Yeah, okay. That's right. Make, make, make me get rid of the other nine states that I visited. Um, I have to say, I think it was Pennsylvania. No! Yes! Uh, see? See? I told you. I told you. We had a real good debate, and what really impressed me was two-thirds of their membership at that convention had been in the party less than six months. And that gave me hope. That gave me hope. Our future is the younger people. There's no question about it. I think that people of my generation can provide you some experience. We can provide you some guidance. But we're on God will term limit me, okay? Um, and there's no question of me using this as a stepping stone to the chair. We now move on to our two-minute close. Uh, you have two minutes, and you cannot rebut during the close, but you can use your cards to extend your time. We will be starting with Sam Goldstein. <laughs> I thought I went last. Do I go first now? Yep. Okay, I'll go. And the last shall be first. Okay. What religion, Sam? Um, or I want to repeat what I said at the beginning just for a second. This is a great convention. I want to thank you all for staying up till 10.30 at night listening to us five expand on our thoughts on the party and on the future of the party. But I do have to emphasize that this chair's race and the vice chair's race is not a race about philosophy. 
You guys set the philosophy of the party and the direction of the party today and tomorrow during the platform debate. The platform is the key document for the philosophy and the guidance of our candidates in how to present our message to the voters. What the vice chair and chair of the party do is manage the daily activities of the party along with the rest of the LNC and also with the staff that we have to supervise. So remember, this is not a race about philosophy. It's not a race about government schools. It's not a race about arming every civilian in the country with an automatic weapon, which would not be a bad idea. But what it is about, it's about finding the individual candidates for both chair and vice chair that you guys think are able to lead this party for the next two years into the next great convention, convention at Austin, Texas, where we will pick a presidential candidate and vice presidential candidate to lead our ticket and maybe get us those 70 million votes that we really deserve. So remember that as you think about who you're going to vote for vice chair and for chair tomorrow. It's an important decision, probably the most important one you'll make here at the convention, because those two individuals, along with the rest of the officers and the LNC, will be the people that provide the guidance to state parties, that will be the individuals that help states begin their ballot access programs and look forward to getting more and more people on the ballot and getting voters more and more choices as to who they want to vote for. Hopefully they will be libertarian voter uh, candidates and libertarian candidates that present a clear, consistent message of a smaller and more tolerant government. They don't have to present every aspect of the platform and every detail of anarcho, capital, pragmatist, whatever libertarianism. The voters have to understand that the government is just too damn big and too damn intolerant and needs to be shrunk back to the point where we can live with it because we're not gonna live in an anarchist society anytime soon. We're gonna live in a society where there are governments and laws and we have to learn to deal with it, but we need to get them off our back as much as possible. Uh, and that's the, that's the society I wanna leave for my grandkids. The two that I talked about earlier and hopefully we'll have some more because we don't have a granddaughter yet. But those are the kids that, that I'm working for and hopefully you guys are working for. We have to meet the future of our children and their children to bring this country back to its roots, a free society, and the only way we can do that in this country is by getting people elected. Thank you. Alex Merced. Hey, everybody. It's been an amazing journey, uh, this whole vice chair's race. I mean, these guys are amazing guys. I've gotten to know them very well over the last six months. I mean, me and Steve Sheets have probably spent a lot of time in a car together. Um, and you know what? No matter what happens, you win, because you get all of us. Okay, we're all going to be leaders within the party. We're all here for you. But again, the big thing, the thing that separates the chair and vice chair position from all the other positions is the visibility of these positions. And again, that position, that can be in a liability, it could be neutral, or it can be an asset. And I think I can really make that an asset by being, being a, pro, a very positive messenger, someone who brings an idea of hope, and always steers people to hear the candidates, not a distract from the candidates, because I want people listening to you. Now, bottom line is I want you guys to get to know me. Okay, so I have, have you probably seen the postcard on your, on your, on your uh, tables? Go to Alex Merced for LNC.com. I have a video there where you can hear even more about what I have to say and what I want to do as your, your next vice chair. Um, let me just throw these out now. So there's another minute. Um, <laughs> but I want you guys to get to know me. I want you to grab me as I walk around here. So don't, don't hesitate to ask me whatever you want. Reach out to me anytime. Also, more than talk to me, talk to the people who know me. Talk to the people who've worked with me. The New York delegation, they know me. The people on the Larry Sharp campaign and the... The volunteers for the Larry Sharp campaign are from all across. Many of your delegations have volunteers for the Larry Sharp campaign. Talk to them. They've worked with me. And just hear what they have to say. I've been around. I'm going to continue working. Regardless of what happens, I'm here for you. But I think I can make this position an asset, an asset that you'll be proud and that I want to make you proud. I want to work for you. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to make my case. I'm going to keep making my case until the last vote is counted. I'm going to act like I'm last until the last vote is counted because I want to earn your vote. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> I want to read something to you guys. This is something that's coming in on Facebook, came in last night. It's publicly available. You can look at a link on my page. The LP was founded to tell people uncomfortable truths. Sometimes you can tell them with a smile, and sometimes you tell them in a few words as possible with a Clint Eastwood grimace. I have waited to see if Arvin blinked or turned timid after a mild chastising by ultra civilitarians. He hasn't. I urge the delegates to re-elect Arvin Vora to keep a burr under the saddle of the soft soap peddlers. That was written by D. Frank Robinson, the co-founder of the Libertarian Party. And right now, the Libertarian Party is absolutely at a crossroads. And if you look at, these two, at, the, at where these two roads lead, I'll tell you exactly where they lead. Road number one leads somewhere like this. We've taken the presidency. We've taken the House of Representatives. We've taken the Senate. And now, we can't lose them. We got there by using manipulative and dishonest messaging. We got there by pandering. And if we start abolishing government schools, if we start legalizing cocaine, if we start shutting down the military welfare complex, we're going to lose. It's better that someone like us is there rather than someone like them is there. That's path number one. Path number two is very different. Path number two is us standing there and saying this. We have won the presidency. We have won the Senate. We have won the House. We told them that we were going to legalize every single drug. We told them we were going to abolish government schools. We said we would end the income tax and not replace with something worse, but end other taxes as well. We told them we were going to legalize weapons. We told them we were going to legalize cryptocurrency and get all these controls out of the way. We told them we were going to end federal departments. We told them that we were going to end all these foreign wars. We said we were going to do it, and now let's go do it. If you elect me vice chair, we are going to be squarely on that second path. I will not stand by and let us pander down that, that first path that leads to nothing but maybe a name change. I want to see meaningful change. I want to see massive reductions in government. And working together, we can and we will make it happen. Off the line up. Steve Sheets. I said this before, I'll say it again. When libertarians come together, great things can happen. Now, I've, I've been an organizer, and I've been fortunate enough to have people come out of varying stripes and varying political philosophies, and we've all worked together to make things happen. You know, we have this huge tyrannical government that we're all fighting against, but there's nothing, nothing that's going to happen unless we actually put down our egos, put down our philosophies, and work together to make something happen. Right now, we've been divided over whose brand of libertarianism is the best brand of libertarianism, and at the same time, we see this tyrannical government continues to grow. And as we keep fighting, nothing happens. I, for one, am sick and tired of nothing happening. I really, really want to see more libertarians get elected. I really, really want to see more of us working together, raising a lot of money, growing our parties, and the only way we can do this is if we come together and work together. I want to put candidates together, novice candidates with experienced candidates. I want people helping home messages. I want people helping with ballot access drives. I want people helping with ballot access challenges. We have a lot of institutional knowledge. Just on this stage, there's a lot of institutional knowledge. Tap us, man. Ask us questions. We all want to work with you. We all want to help you. We all want everybody here to succeed. Me especially. I want the people in Pennsylvania to have the largest number of libertarians elected. I'm not sure, maybe we do. Let's keep that trend. I want to see that trend repeated in every state across the nation. Let's get libertarians on the ballot. Let's get libertarians winning. Thank you. Joe Halpman. JFK said, those who wish to change reality must first be willing to face it. Sam was right in one sense, the government is too damn big. But the other problem is, we're too damn small. 
We have built a large tent. We have to fill it. And filling it means we're going to have people that don't agree with us. I don't know if the tent that Arvin wants has a space for me. I do know the tent that I want has a space for Arvin. We believe, we believe in a marketplace, the marketplace of ideas. Let the party be that marketplace. Let the states be that marketplace. Those of you who feel that we must be the pure and the powerful, show us. Show me I'm wrong. I'd love to be wrong. Those who feel that the people need to be led more slowly to build up their freedom muscles, let's show them that it can be done. Yes, it's dangerous. Life is a slippery slope. Okay, we cannot create Libertopia overnight. And guess what, folks? There are people out there who are going to work against us the entire way. We will never actually win. How's that for depressing? <laughs> but what it boils down to is it's not a sprint. It's not a marathon. It's a relay of marathons. And some of the members of our team haven't even been born yet. Ladies and gentlemen, give your candidates an enthusiastic round of applause. Vice Chair, Alex Merced, Arvind Vora, Steve Sheets, Joe Hauptman, Sam Goldstein. And give yourselves a round of applause. You've been here all damn day. Thank you. Good night. See you tomorrow.